All right, you may be seated. Call your next witness. State calls Karen Poole. Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Ma'am, state your full name for the record. Uh, Karen Ann Kuhn. And how do you spell your last name? K-U-E-H-N. How are you currently employed? I am a stills photographer on uh, film sets and uh, sometimes a wrangler. Uh, what does a stills photographer do on film sets? We document scenes, uh, behind the scenes, and do gallery work and specials for billboards, posters, whatever the, whatever the production needs. Okay. Uh, were you employed as the stills photographer on the set of Rust? Yes. And if you recall, can, can you estimate for us approximately how many photographs you took uh, during the the time that you were working on rest, do you have any idea? Um, maybe nine nine thousand. Okay, <laughs> about lot. two thousand a day at the most, probably. Okay. Um, I am going to. Well, before you came in today, did you uh, did you have an opportunity to to review one of the photographs that you took? I did. Okay. Um, I am going to ask the court to admit States Exhibit 165. I believe there's no objection. No objection. All right. Thank you. Uh, 165 is admitted. You may publish. Yes. It's off. It went off again. Here. I can turn if you want. No, no, you're fine. What? These guys will take care of it. I'm not. I never do. <laughs> yes. Ma'am, do you recognize this photo? I do. Um, can you tell us the date that this photo was taken? I believe it was on the 15th. Of what month? October. And would that have been 2021? Yes. Um, and do you recognize this person here? Yes, that's Hannah. Okay. And who's this person here? Alec. And why were you taking this photo? I just shoot a lot, and I think the behind the scenes is really interesting, what's going on. So they're having a conversation about what's about to happen. And um, okay. that's it. Um, do you know what this is in Ms. Gutierrez's hand? It looks like the gun belt, I'm guessing, I'm guessing for Alec. OK. Or a bandolier, one of those. OK. I see a gun in it. All right. I'm going to zoom in on this photo. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, when you look at, well, tell us what's, uh, what's in that gun belt. Ammunition and a uh, gun. And do you notice anything about the center primers of the ammunition that's in that belt? One is silver and quite different from the other three, four. All right. And that was October 15th, you said, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Can I leave this here? Yeah. You can just, you can use it. You can set things on it if you want. Thank you. 
Good morning, Ms. Kuhn. Good morning. Um, is it true that you were budgeted for five days of work for the entire show? Yes. Okay. Um, and were you ever tasked with taking any pictures of guns pointing into the camera? Yes. Who made you take pictures of guns pointing into the camera? One of the junior producers, Ryan Smith emphasize that I should get as many shots of guns pointed into the camera as possible. Okay, so so then you were told to do this on many occasions? Um, maybe twice. Uh, when, when those photos are taken of guns pointing into the camera, are they, are they actually pointed at you, directly at you then? Um, when it's the gallery shoot, yes, and those guns have to be checked by the armor before, which I trusted was happening because she was nearby. Uh, when filming uh, in New Mexico, uh, did it appear to you that Alec Baldwin was the boss? Yes. Did you ever see anybody tell Alec Baldwin no? No. Uh, and in terms of the structure, did it appear that other producers were below him? Yes. Did you see other producers on the set frequently? Yes. Uh, how frequently did you see other producers on set? Pretty much every day I was there. Were the other producers sometimes even in some of the photos that you were taking? Yes. You had to Photoshop them out? No, I don't do Photoshop. Okay. Uh, what about Gabrielle Pickle? Um, was, what was your, did it appear to you like, well first, did you have interactions with Gabrielle Pickle? Very little, just the initial deal. Did it appear to you um, in your perception that, that the budget was a major concern to Gabrielle Pickle? That's her job. She's the line producer, I believe, and so she has to come in according to whatever the budget is. Okay. Do you recall believing that she was trying to be cheap, to cheap everybody down? On the lower tier, lower budget shows, that's what they all do. And, and that's what you observed from Gabrielle Pickle on this show? I didn't get involved with her about everybody else's deal, just my deal, and I just made a deal with her, and, and that was it. Okay, but um, I'm trying to get at your perception of her, and whether in fact, um, I'm not sure if you're quite answering, did you, did you believe that she was cheap, cheap, cheap? I don't have an opinion. Uh, do you remember testifying or state, making statements about your opinion of her previously where you said she was cheap? Well. That was the nature of this show. It was a low budget tier. Okay, and, and I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about your opinion about Gabrielle Pickle and whether you once believed she was cheap, cheap, cheap. Um, I don't recall if I said that, then I said that. Would it refresh your memory to look at a transcript of your pretrial interview in this case? If I said it, then okay. I, I said it. I mean, that was the, the overall feeling with everybody. Everybody's always trying to get more money. That's just the way it goes. Okay, thank you. Uh, were you actually in the church at the time of the shooting incident in this case? I was. And do you recall ever seeing uh, Hannah Gutierrez in the church at that time? I do not. I saw her outside. Would you agree with me that after lunch, right before the shooting, everybody on set was rushing to get the set all up and going? I would agree with that. I don't believe I have any other questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kuhn, I want to ask you a couple questions about um, taking photos of guns pointed at the camera. Um, you indicated that you thought that Ms. Gutierrez had checked the gun. I believed so. Um, let me ask you, did Ms. Gutierrez uh, check the gun in your presence? 
Not that I recall. Um, and how many movie sets do you think you've worked on that had armorers? Over a dozen. Um, in your experience, does the armor generally check the gun in the actor's presence or the assistant director's presence? Yes. Uh, did that happen in this case? I didn't see that. I also came into the church a little bit later. And I'm not talking about inside the church. I'm talking about with you when, when you were taking those photos. Right. I, I just don't recall. I wasn't paying attention to that. I was paying attention to just documenting what okay. was going on. Well, um, would you recall if Ms. Gutierrez showed you the dummy rounds and shook them for you when she put yes, them in the gun? Yes, I would recall that, but I don't. Okay. Uh, so is it your testimony that that did not happen? I don't know. I don't know if she checked them. It's not my job. She didn't check them in front of you? No. Okay, understood. Um, <clears throat> was Ms. Gutierrez present uh, for those close-up shots of, uh, of guns pointed at the camera? She was nearby. Uh, we were in a very small space outside of a barn uh, for a gallery shoot, and I asked her to check everything, and I trusted that she did that, and I was inside and working with the, with the uh, talent on those days, and that, um, that space is probably 20 by 30. Very small, you can't have a lot of people in there. Okay, um, you were asked some questions about Ms. Pickle and the, uh, the budget. Mm -hmm. um, do you generally work on movies uh, in the state of New Mexico? Yes. Uh, you live in New Mexico, right? Yes. And are a lot of films that are made in New Mexico, low budget movies? It's a mix. It's a mix. Okay. Uh, do you have any, any knowledge about um, New Mexico tax incentives um, and how, how that happens with regard to different tiers of movies? Not enough to talk about, but okay. I know they get a discount if they hire our local crew, which we appreciate. Okay, of course, understood. Um, on October 21st, 2021, uh, when you were um, inside the church, and I'm talking about shortly before um, the incident where Ms. Hutchins was shot, uh, were you paying close attention to Ms. Gutierrez and what she was doing? No, I was paying attention to Alec because he was handling a gun. As I walked in the church, I thought, ah, oh, there's some shots happening, photographs. So I kind of went right in to get some photos of him, and then he pointed at me to get out of the way um, and out of his personal space. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're excused. Thank you very much. Next witness. State calls Marissa Popple. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Sorry, I didn't realize we were still uh, presenting on the, the screen. Um, you want that on? It, well, let's leave it on for now, now that I've <coughs> figured out what's going on. Um, Ms. Popple, good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, thank you for... Uh, returning to answer some additional questions. Um, I would like to show you uh, a series of photographs, uh, and I believe there is no objection to these photos. Are they, are, are they new exhibits? They are exhibits. All right. And the photos are going to be 166 through 173. All right. There's no objection to their admission. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, 
you're admitted, you may publish. Okay. Uh, Ms. Popple, do you see that photograph there that's on your screen and I'm showing you States Exhibit 166? Yes, I do. Well, what is that a photo of? This is a photo of dummy rounds that were removed from a box that was located in the prop truck and then they were laid out on brown paper and re-photographed. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as States Exhibit 48A. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that and how does it relate to the photo that we just looked at? These are those same rounds while they were still in the foam insert. And are these the rounds that came out of the box that had the blue Sharpie writing on the, on the label? Yes. I'm showing you what's been marked as States Exhibit 167. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yes, this is a box of uh, live rounds that were collected from PDQ. And is one of them dissimilar than the others? Yes, in the bottom corner, one of them has a silver primer. Can you talk about this one over here? Yes. Was that the only live round with a silver primer that you found at PDQ? No. I'm going to have relates to the previous photo of this one here, 167. What's 168? These are those same rounds removed from the box and laid out. Do you know which of these uh, has the silver primer? Uh, it would be one of the rounds that's by itself. One of these over here? Yes. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, the shape of the projectile, is the shape of the projectile similar to the live rounds that were found on the set of rust? No. Um, is the head stamp of, of the round, uh, and in fact, let's move to uh, States Exhibit 169, is that a close-up of that live round? Yes. Uh, is the head stamp uh, of this live round the same as the head stamp of the live rounds from the set of rust? No. States Exhibit 170, what are we looking at here? These were additional rounds that were located at PDQ that had silver and color primers. And um, are the head stamps the same as the, as the live rounds found on the set of rust? No. One, States Exhibit 171, what's this? This is a top view of those uh, same live rounds located at PDQ with the silver primer. Um, is the projectile shape uh, the same as the live rounds that were found on the set of rust? No. The live rounds with silver primers that came from PDQ, how many did you find? Uh, there were, I'm sorry, say that one more time. How many live rounds at PDQ with silver primers did you discover and photograph? 10. 10 out of all of them? Yes. Okay. And have we looked at all of them this morning? Yes. States Exhibit 172, what is this? This is the outside uh, of a ammunition box that was located in Lieutenant Benavidez, Benavidez's vehicle. And based on your uh, experience in this case, uh, do you know what kind of ammunition that box uh, contained? Uh, this contained blank rounds. Okay. And States Exhibit 173, what is this? This is the outside of an ammunition box that was located on top of the cart. And what kind of ammunition was inside this box? There were blanks inside this box. I'm going to show you what is previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 4. Do you recognize that? Yes. Um, the box that we just looked at, can you tell us where it is on the cart? Yes, it's off to the side. 
Is it this one right here? Yes, where your cursor is. Okay, all right, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Good morning again. Good morning. Ms. Popple, so you testified earlier you all found 10 live rounds and that was in the search that occurred approximately one month after the shooting, is that right? Yes. So again, you have no idea what happened in the month in which went by that you all weren't there to search, right? Correct. Now States Exhibit 4, you testified at the end, uh, you looked at that exhibit and told the jury where that box was on the card. Do you recall that? Yes. Now, it's also been your prior testimony, is it not, that you put that box back in the card from Benavides' vehicle, is that right? No. Okay, uh, was that box there before? Yes. Okay, so that wasn't one of the two boxes that were removed from Benavides' vehicle and put back on? Correct, those were placed in a brown paper bag and secured in the scene. Okay. Your Honor, if I may approach to show some exhibit. Now I'm going to show you first what's marked as exhibit Q, uh, defense Q, and ask if you recognize that. Yes, I recognize it. Did you, I'm oh, sorry, did you take that photograph? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, I'd move defendant's Q into evidence. No objection, no objection to any of these. All right, defendant's Q. Thank you, Counsel. So then I will move in, Your Honor, defendants R through D, D as well. R through what? D, D as in David. It goes all the way through R through Z, and then <coughs> A, A, B, B, C, C, and D, D. Can you speak a little bit up here? Just a little bit. Yes. All right. So Q through Z, and then A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. All right. They're admitted. You may publish. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. First, I've got defendant's cue, and I want to show you that picture. Move that microphone closer to you. Oh yeah. Ms. Popple, defendant's cue. Can you tell the jury what what that photograph is? This was a photo of dummy ammunition that was located at PDQ. Now, when you say it was dummy ammunition, did you send these to the FBI lab? No, we did not. And did you actually? Uh, seize those and take them to the sheriff's office? No. So you took a picture and you uh, concluded they were dummies without getting lab confirmation, is that right? Yes. Okay, I want to show you uh, next defendant's S. And it's, what is that picture? Um, I believe this was a, I'm sorry, 
Um, I believe this was a box of, uh, you know what, I, I can't determine it out of context, I apologize. <laughs> okay, um, but this was something you took at PDQ Props? I, I couldn't determine it out of context, I apologize. Okay. It's okay. I have over 2,000 photographs, and sure. mostly of ammunition, so. Um, defendant's T, can you tell the jury what that is? Uh, this was the outside of the box where live rounds were located at PDQ. Defendant's W, can you tell the jury what this is? Um, could you turn the photo? Sure. Yeah, that would be easier. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, were, uh, this was boxes of ammunition that were located at PDQ. Okay. Hey, defendants D, D, can you tell the jury what that photo is? This was another photograph taken at PDQ. Did you, uh, is this in the state it was in when you, obviously when you got there for the search? Yes. What are those um, items in the back? They're yellow and green. Uh, you see at the very top right. What are those things? Uh, I'm not sure, some form of tool. Did you inspect that tool at all to find out what it was? I believe that uh, Sergeant Zook assisted with that aspect. Do you, were there any, were there any um, rounds in this picture? Um, if you could move it up just because my portion has lettering underneath it. Sure, yeah. Um, there were uh, rounds on the table, yes. So there, there is, um, and just to describe, there's rounds laying in a mix of uh, all kinds of stuff. I don't even know what to call it. Is that clutter? Would that be a good word? I there mean, were a large amount of items on the table. Okay. What is the green cans? What are those? I don't recall what the green cans were. Okay. And what is that brown canister in the middle, or whatever that is, a box? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay, I should point this thing right here. Uh, the black box that's there, I don't recall what it was. Did you all uh, pick up these and look under them? Pick up the clutter and look under it? Yes, items were moved. Okay, so if, if you found anything under it, can you tell us what that was? Uh, nothing that, uh, nothing located underneath it was collected by us. Okay. Um, what are those manuals in the, the top right? Did you look at those? I don't recall what those manuals were. Did you um, determine whether there was any equipment or other tools within the PDQ props? If there were tools? Uh, equipment, first of all, like machines? Uh, I don't recall there being machines. I mean, there were some miscellaneous tools. Okay. Do you know what a reloading machine is? I know what it is, yes. I'm going to show you defendants to you. Again, I'm going to show you the, those items I was talking about, the yellow and green. And seeing those closer, does that refresh your memory as to whether you might have seen what those were? Uh, it does not. I, I did not inspect those items personally. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you again defendants W. Do you remember seeing on any of these boxes that you... Uh, looked through or inspected the JS initials? Um, yes, multiple boxes had JS initials. I'm going to show you defendant's V. Uh, Ma'am, do you, 
What is this picture that we're looking at? Um, I don't recall uh, exactly where this picture originated from. I'm going to show you Defendant's X. Um, can you tell the jury what this picture is? These are more uh, ammo boxes that were located at PDQ. Now, did you find any um, written inventory system uh, in the paperwork that you might have inspected at this search? I did not myself, no. Did you determine whether there was any computerized inventory system that kind of cataloged where things were? That I do not know. I'm going to show you Defendant's V. Oh, better turn it right side up. Defendant's V, can you tell the jury what that is? These were more ammunition boxes located at PDQ. Were you able to ascertain any type of system um, just staring at everything as to how these were arranged? Uh, they seem to be arranged by ammo type. And were they all kind of put in together, did you ever see bags of rounds put in by boxes? I don't recall. I'm going to show you Defendant's AA. Does that appear to be bags of rounds by boxes? Yes. Okay. So again, that was... Um, how it, it was when you took this picture at the search, correct? Yes. Okay. You know, I have, uh, let me see, Judge, just one second. Okay, Your Honor, I have no more questions. Redirect. <clears throat> Ms. Popple, when you were at uh, PDQ, you were there pursuant to a, a search warrant, is that right? Yes. And did the search warrant let you take from that property anything you wanted to? No, it had restrictions. What were the restrictions of the warrant? We were looking specifically for live ammunition in a forty-five caliber. Okay. Um, 45 caliber live ammunition. Yes. Okay. Um, did you take all of the 45 caliber live ammunition from PDQ into evidence? Yes. Um, of all of the 45 caliber live ammunition that you took from PDQ, was any of it similar to the live rounds found on the set of rust? No. I'm going to show you um, what was marked as Defendant's Exhibit Z. Were all of those boxes taken into evidence? No. Why not? Because they did not contain 45 caliber live rounds. marked as Defendant's Exhibit AA. Do you see that? Yes. Um, those, uh, these bags of, uh, of uh, I'm a little reluctant to call them ammunition, um, but what appears to be, at a minimum, brass casings. Um, were those uh, taken into evidence? No. Why not? Because they were not 45 caliber live ammunition. As you look at that photo, do you know whether they were live ammunition at all? Uh, no, I don't believe they were. I don't have anything further, thank you. 
Your excuse, thank you. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, have a seat talking to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Smith, go ahead and state your full name for the record. Rebecca Smith. And uh, Ms. Smith, in October of 2021, how were you employed? I was employed as Key Craft Services. Was that on the set of rust? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, can you explain to the jury what Key Craft Services does? Key Craft Services is basically a set mom. Um, I show up and make sure that coffee is ready for everybody, that everybody has snacks and hydration. If they run out of sunscreen, if they run out of chapstick, they come to me. Um, and. What hotel were you staying at w when you were working on the set of rest? The Inn at Santa Fe. And was Ms. Gutierrez also staying there? Yes, ma'am. Um, during the, the time that the two of you were both working on the set of rest, did you get to know her? Know her? No. Um, I had a chance to sit with her once or twice, but not, not really get to know her. Okay. Um, would you say she was more of an acquaintance? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and Ms. Smith, were you present at the hotel uh, the evening of October 21st, 2021? Yes, ma'am. And at some point that evening, did you go to Ms. Gutierrez's hotel room? Yes. And why did you do that? Um, court and I forget what his name was, but the set steward um, were in her hotel room and needed to go to the store to get something and did not want to leave her alone. So they called me and asked me to come up to her room. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, ma'am. Um, and did you stay with Ms. Gutierrez for a little while? Yes, ma'am. Um, and then at some point, did you leave? Yes. Um, did anything unusual happen when you left Ms. Gutierrez's room? Yes. She asked me if I could hold on to something for her. I said yes. She put it in my hand and I walked out as there was a knock on the door. And after you uh, left the room, did you look to see what she had placed in your hand? Yes. And. Can you describe, without making any assumptions about what it was, can you just describe what you saw in your hand? Yes. It was a clear Ziploc baggie with a green small Ziploc baggie inside. 
and there was powder inside the green baggie. What color was the powder? White. Um, if I want you to compare this to like a sugar packet that you it was would... definitely not sugar. No, 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 okay. no. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> let let let, let me get my look like sugar. Let anyway. me get my question out. Okay. Um, I want you. I'm, I want to. I want to have a discussion about how much was in the green. Okay. Part, and I want you to compare it to a sugar packet that you would open and put in coffee or tea. Okay. How many of those do you think it was? Maybe four or five. Okay. Um, and Ms. Smith, how old are you? I'm 50, 51. And when you were uh, a younger person, uh, did you have an opportunity to use the drug cocaine? Yes, ma'am. I'm a recovering addict. Um, are you familiar with what cocaine looks like? Yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with the way that cocaine is packaged? Yes, ma'am. Um, Based on that experience, what did you believe to be in the bag? I believed it to be cocaine. And what did you do with it? I threw it in the hallway trash can before even going downstairs to my hotel room. And why did you throw it in the hallway trash can? Because like I said, I am a recovering addict. I can't first and foremost have it in my possession. And second, I was I was really very offended and I didn't want anything to do with the situation anymore. Okay. Um, after, after October 21st um, uh, passes, uh, did you receive any text message communications from Ms. Gutierrez? Yes. And, Several. And generally speaking what were the what what was the theme of those messages i want my stuff back <laughs> um other than the bag with containing the green bag containing the white powder other than that item did you have anything else that belonged to ms gutierrez no ma'am um did you bring this information to the attention of law enforcement? No, ma'am. Why not? Like I said, I didn't want to be involved in the situation if I didn't have to be. Okay. Um, and how long after the incident do you think it was before someone reached out to you to talk to you about this? I believe it was about September of 2023 when you contacted me about it. And I personally called you? Yes, ma'am. Texted, I believe it was. Okay. Uh, and, and did you uh, tell me on that day what you have testified to today? Yes, ma'am. I'll pass the witness. Ms. Smith, good morning. Good morning. Now, ma'am, that night uh, when you went to Ms. Uh, Gutierrez Reed hotel room, you were called over and, and Ms. Gutierrez Reed was distraught, correct? Yes. Now, you were called over and there were, um, you could see she was visibly distraught, couldn't you? Yes. And didn't you say that you would stay with her that night, make sure she was okay? I said I would stay with her for a little bit, yes, until court and the steward came back. Okay. And at the time you left, had they gotten back? No. So before they got back, despite your word earlier, you left? Yes. Okay. Um, didn't uh, did Ms. Gutierrez-Reed also go to your room that night? No. Now, your testimony is that the last time you used cocaine was approximately 20 years old. Is that right? Yes, sir. So that would have been, I think, 31 years ago? Yes. And since then, thankfully, you've been clean. Is that right? Yes, sir. So you have not seen that substance in 31 years. That's fair to say? No, that's not fair to say. Okay. I have seen it, just not used it. Okay. Now... You, you stated on direct examination that you believed it to be cocaine. Yes. 
And do you recall stating at one point that you said it could be cocaine or meth? Um, I don't recall saying that, no. Okay, do you recall at your pretrial interview being asked the question, what was in those baggies? Inside the green, well, inside the snack baggie was the green baggie. Inside the green baggie was a white powdery substance, which I knew to be cocaine, or I mean, it could have been meth or something too. It could have. Okay. But I don't believe that it was, nor did I state that I believed it was. I just said that it could be. And, and that was my question. I'm just asking if you said it could have been meth too. Correct. So in reality, it could have been a number of other white powders. Would you agree with that? Sure. Uh, do you know what creatine looks like? No. A protein powder? Mm, yes, because yeah. I work in craft services. Okay. Um, and we could go through a whole list of items, but there's a lot of white powder, powdered sugar, right? Mm-hmm. Is that yes. correct? Okay. So the reality is you have a belief, but you don't know for certain what was in that bag, do you? Correct. Now, that was never tested? No. And that was never provided to law enforcement? No. How long did you hold that baggie before you threw it in the trash? I didn't make it all the way down the hallway. So how many feet do you think that was that you walked? Um, I don't even know how many feet the hallway is long, so can you, I mean... Can you look at the courtroom and estimate just telling us? Um, possibly to the distance of the gentleman in the blue suit. Okay, is he seated right at the council here, yes. table? So, would you agree with me that's about 20, 25 feet? Sure. Okay. So, you walked 20, 25 feet, and were you looking at that bag the whole time, or were you having it down by your side? At first, it was down by my side, and then I, of course, raised my hand to look. Okay. Now, weren't you walking past some police officers, too? Um, men in uniform? Not sure whether they were police officers. Well, what do the uniforms look like? Um, they could have been armed security. I did not see an actual badge, so I could not say for sure that they were police. They were men in uniform in either security or police. Well, do you recall uh, being asked the question, why didn't you just hand it back to her? And you said, because I didn't want to do anything in front of the police. On page 19 of your interview? Yes. So at that time at your interview, you indicated they were police. I indicated that I believed that they were police, yes. No, you didn't say believe. You said, because I didn't want to do anything in front of the police. So were they police or not? I don't know. So you walk down 25 feet, you look up at it, and then you throw it in the trash. Is that right? I looked at it and then waited for the trash can, of course. I didn't throw it on the floor or anything, so I did have to wait for the trash can to be there. Sure. So you, uh, in fairness, you probably had five seconds to look at this bag. Is that about right? Yes. So you had a five-second glance through a white baggie and a green baggie, uh, and you then based your conclusion on that. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you also said that you thought this was about four to five sugar packets. Correct. Okay. Well, do you recall uh, previously stating that this you didn't know what the weight was? Correct. And do you recall indicating that it could be a couple of pounds? No. Okay. No. Well, do you recall being asked a um, question, so you have no experience with weight, and you testify, well, I don't know what it weighed. I mean, it looked it could be an eight ball, but I don't even know what an eight ball weighs. So, I mean, that's like asking me how much this weighs. I don't know. It's a couple of pounds. Do you want to see this? No, I don't need okay. to see it. What okay. I was referring to was a body armor 
that I had already opened and taken a couple of drinks of, and I held it up and said, I don't know what this weighs, maybe a pound or two. That was in reference to the body armor, not to the baggies. Okay, well, in reality, in a five-second glance, would you agree with me, you have no idea what the weight was? Correct. Okay. And, and you have, you really, other than your guess, you have no idea for certain what was in that bag? Correct. Then I, I have, may I just have one moment? Last question. Do you recall in those text messages between you and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, she at one point asked you back for her things, plural? Yes. Okay. And so things is more than one, right? Yes. Okay. I have nothing further. Redirect. Um, Ms. Smith, have you ever seen powdered sugar packaged like that? Never. Have you ever seen regular sugar packaged like that? Never. Have you seen cocaine packaged like that? Yes. Um, you were asked some questions about your um, contact with Ms. Gutierrez inside the room. Uh, did you, when you were in there, in Ms. Gutierrez's room visiting with her, did you speak with her? Yes. Um, did she uh, mention to you that she was extremely worried about Ms. Hutchins and, and Ms. Hutchins' death? No, ma'am. Um, what specifically did she say to you when, when you were in her room with regard to any concerns that she had? She was concerned about her career. She was concerned about being prosecuted um, because somebody got shot. All right. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Ask one more question. Can can we approach real quick? Yeah. Ma'am, you were the one that told Ms. Gutierrez Reed that night that Helena had passed, correct? Yes. Okay, nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Next witness. Uh, let, me, uh, let me look at the list in just one second. Mm -hmm. State will call Seth Penny. All rise. Thank you. We're in recess. We'll um, once you get back here at five of. Okay. Thank you.
Be seated. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, sir. State your full name for the record, please. Good morning. Seth Andrew Kenny. Um, Mr. Kenny, <clears throat> where to begin? Um, in October of 2021, what kind of business did you run? I ran a, um, a prop and weapons supply uh, house to the film and entertainment industry. Could be anything from theater um, and also volunteer work associated with uh, active shooter training. Okay. W would you move that microphone a little closer sure. to you there? Yep. If you can. All right. Um, and... Do you still have that business? I do. Um, how did you get into the into the prop supply business? I got contacted um, in about 2009. Uh, had previously been consulting for a firearms business, indoor shooting range, and retail uh, segment, as well as some law enforcement training. So there was a crossover. And from that, I met... Uh, uh, an individual that was working in the film industry and at some point he said he needed some help and it was just going to be a two-month thing turned into 15 years okay uh, and that individual uh, what kind of work did that individual do he did a similar thing where he provided he set up weapons sent them out onto shows and also worked as an armor on set okay um, So how long have you owned PDQ Props? It's been about 12 years, maybe 13. Okay. And at some point, sir, uh, did you meet a gentleman by the name of Thel Reed? I did, very briefly. Oh, I was aware of Thel Reed um, because we were on opposite ends. He was working set on, um, on Django Unchained. And I was behind the scenes working with a prop master, preparing the weapons that were going to be used by cast. Um, so I was aware of him then. Uh, and then very briefly, one day, a prop master brought him into uh, the LA Prop House Arsenal, where I did actually meet him. It wasn't again until about 2018, where we became friends. Okay. Um, so when the two of you became friends, um, what was what did Thel do for a living, and how did it relate to what you did? Well, primarily, he's more than anything. He's a, he's a gun coach, um, and he does work set as an armor as well. But something that he's unrivaled in is is as being a gun coach. Um, as an armor, he does a fantastic job, or he did uh, back in the day. So um, he would he would work set. Uh, and on the back end, I would prepare the weapons for the most part. I work set as, as little as possible. Okay, when you say work set, what do you mean? Actually, uh, ending up on a call sheet, being hired by a film production. It could be episodics. It could be any, any TV show that you might see. Uh, you know, Walking Dead, for, in, you know, Walking Dead, for instance. Uh, and then, or it could just be a feature film. Uh, okay like Django and Chain. And so when you when you are hired by production, uh, you end up being an employee or an independent consultant for that production. Okay. Uh, so working on set was not your thing? Definitely not my focus. Okay. Um, and what, at some point in time, did you and Mr. Reed um, work on a film together where Mr. Reed was uh, an armorer or a coach and you were the vendor, the, the supplier. That was, uh, it was 1883. Uh, it wasn't a feature film. It was more of a, you know, one run episodic. 
Um, and I had been working with Taylor Sheridan's prop master. Um, and who's Taylor Sheridan? Taylor Sheridan is a writer, director of, of the Paramount production. And he's kind of created his own segment of Americana that's very popular. Uh, are you talking about uh, Yellowstone and 1883? Yellowstone 1883, uh, Yellowstone 1923, uh, Mary of Kingstown, uh, Sicario. He wrote Sicario, both, I believe, uh, Wind River, amazing movie. Okay. That was actually the first time that uh, I, I had been a provider consultant for Taylor Sheridan was on Wind River. Okay. Uh, let's jump back to 1883. Uh, describe for the jury, please, how you and Mr. Reed sort of uh, worked together on that series. Well, I had to push hard to get him onto the crew and hired. Um, and so we talked about it, and I was, I'm fairly tight with a prop master. You know, again, we've been working together since Wind River. Um, and I convinced him to hire Thale um, and to keep him on longer than most gun coaches or older persons would be allowed on set. You know, frankly, the Texas heat was just too much for him. Um, so. And, and, and just so that everyone knows, approximately how old is Mr. Reed now? Exactly, I don't know, but he's gonna be pushing 80. Okay. Um, so in, in what capacity was Mr. Reed um, hired on the set of 1883, was he a coach or an armorer? Primarily, he was a, he was the gun coach, and he and he had difficulty with the Texas heat. So you know, I was constantly making sure that he was in an air conditioned environment, and that's not, just not something that a, a a set on Texas allows for. Sure. Um, so describe for the jury the kind of gun coaching that was being done on 1883? Well, it, it, it involved initially, it was pretty casual and we were using replicas and it in, in happened to be Taylor Sheridan's private um, uh, arena. When you it, say replicas, are you talking about real guns or fake guns? These are fake, these are fake guns, okay. replicas, yeah. And, and so that's where it started. It's kind of a meet and greet and just get some of the basics down. And Thale, you know, he's been doing it for so many decades, 60 plus years as a gun coach and armor. Uh, he knows uh, small bite-sized pieces to the, to the actors is, is best. Okay. So. Um, was there uh, coaching sessions that included real firearms? There were, then at some point uh, it was decided uh, uh, and I'm not sure who made that decision, that they actually wanted to um, set up in, in a, a private range on a portion of Taylor Sheridan's private ranch uh, with an appropriate backstop and it controls. And that is where the, um, the cast, it was a bit of a team building as well, learned about the, the, how the, function, the functioning of the firearms, you know, and we were mixed between blanks and live, um, we had live ammunition in one area and then take people off to the side and shoot blanks. And essentially the safe distance on most blanks is about 20 feet. So we would take them away from the firing line and test and train them there. And primarily they had gotten it by that point. They had really understood for their characters what they needed to be and do on set. So you mentioned that during uh, these coaching sessions, uh, some of the cast was shooting with live ammunition. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you recall what kind of caliber weapons the cast uh, was using to shoot that live ammunition from? It was a mix we had available from memory, uh, 12 gauge birdshot, just the basics of, of that. I don't think we even, we even touched that ammo. Um, the prop master had some guns that were chambered in 357, I believe, some lever actions, uh, and also in 45 Colt or 45 Long Colt. Both are okay. Both All right. terms. Um, can you explain to the jury 
Well, let me ask you this. Do you know where the live ammunition came from that was used in those coaching sessions? I do. Well, where did it come from? The 45 Long Colt came from Thale. Um, he had a number of reloads uh, that I asked him to bring because at that time it was very difficult to source live ammunition. Uh, it, was, it was difficult. So he had uh, what turned out to be 325 reloads of 45 Long Colt. And when you say reload, what are you talking about? Well, it's, it, it's once used case. So every case of ammunition starts out as new. And at that point... What do you mean when you say case? The actual brass case. So if we talk about a round of ammunition, there are four components to that. There's the yellowish colored brass case, the primer that is pressed into the base of the case. Then we have gunpowder, some type of, it could be black powder, synthetic black powder, modern uh, smokeless powder, and then you need a projectile. And so those four, co those four components make up a single round of ammunition. Okay, uh, so the, um, the live ammunition that was used for the coaching session was provided by Mr. Reed. Correct. And if you know, I don't know if you do, do you know where he got it? Yes, he said he got it from Joe Swanson. Okay, and who's Joe Swanson? Joe Swanson is probably the primary supplier of blanks and dummy rounds to worldwide. Uh, if, if you happen to see something go bang in a puff of smoke in a, in a movie or, or an episodic a television show, worldwide, chances are that Joe Swanson made it. Okay. <clears throat> Now, was all of the 45 Long Colt live ammunition that was used for the training camp on 1883, was it all used up? No. Uh, so can you tell us approximately how much was left over? Uh, it was... If memory serves me correct, uh, it was about 125 rounds, roughly. And what happened to that ammunition after you finished training the actors on 1883? Well, that's a little bit hazy. At one point, I do recall that um, it, certain things were offloaded um, from my sprinter van because they just weren't needed. Um, and that was, that was one of those things. But at some point, it got moved back to Albuquerque, and I've never been able to pinpoint the date. Um, the live ammunition was moved back to Albuquerque? Correct. And specifically, where in Albuquerque was it being housed? It was in a gray bin marked live ammunition, and it was actually in the bathroom. Of where? Of uh, PDQ's location in Albuquerque. Of your business? Correct. Okay. Um, and can you explain to uh, the jury how you um, how you would keep how did you know it was live and how were you able to keep it separate from dummies and blanks? Well, it's 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 obviously it's a concern anytime you've got these things in let's just say one structure. Um, and in this instance, always better to keep live ammunition near blanks rather than dummy rounds because dummy rounds and live ammunition can look exactly the same. So if, if we were to look, if I were to set aside a single blank and a, piece of, and, a, and a round, single round of live ammunition, it would be obvious which is which just from looking at it, okay? The same cannot be said for live ammunition. So these are, these are things that should never be next to each other. Um, did you keep all of the 45 Long Colt live ammunition in the gray bin? It was in the gray bin, and it was marked on two sides live ammunition. Um, did you have 45 Long Colt live ammunition stored anywhere other than the gray bin at PDQ in Albuquerque? No. 
And do you recall um, a search warrant being executed at PDQ? I do. And when the search warrant was executed, were you present? I was. Um, did you aid the police? Absolutely. Um, and did you provide law enforcement all of the 45 Colt live ammunition that you had at PDQ? Yes, and it wasn't it wasn't spelled out in the warrant that way. Um, it if my memory serves me correct, the warrant specified that any any live yeah, well, and it's okay. I'll, okay. I'll I'll make we'll move on from that. I understand your concerns. Um, so let's not talk about the warrant, okay? Um, was there another show that you and Mr. Reed uh, both supplied firearms and ammunition to after 1883? No. So not let, that I let, let me. Did, did you supply firearms or and when i say ammunition i apologize i mean blanks and dummies um to the set of a movie called the old way yes but th that was filming concurrently with 1883. okay they were happening at the same time yes all right um so the what did you wait, provide excuse me wait actually sorry um now that I think about it, actually, Hannah was wrapping the old way, and we were still in pre-production at that point. I don't think we had gone to camera yet. On 1883? Yeah. I remember being in Texas at the time when Hannah was wrapping out the old way, which is essentially concluding filming. They, you know, no more camera work at all, right? She's packing up her guns. She's packing up her, you know, her bags okay. to, to leave Livingston, Montana. And we were still prepping to go to camera, but working for production on 1883. Okay. Uh, so you indicated that Hannah was involved in uh, the movie The Old Way. Can you explain to the jury in what capacity was she working on that film? Well, it was her first solo lead um, as head armor. Um, and uh, Thail got in touch with me and said no, that... Hang on. I don't want any hearsay. Okay. Um, so, so she she was the lead armor, and that was the first movie she was lead armor on. Correct. Okay. Um, explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you supplied to the set of the old way. It, roughly uh, half the guns, most of them the long arms, which are lever actions and shotguns and single shot uh, rifles as well. And then there was a mix of about 50, 50%, 50% uh, Thale, 50% PDQ supplied the blanks. Um, I supplied 14 rounds of 38, 40 dummy rounds, and Thale and Hannah supplied the balance of the dummy rounds. Okay, so you supplied the only dummies that you supplied to the old way were caliber 3840. Correct. Did you supply any 45 long Colt dummy rounds to the set of the old way? No, I didn't have any. And you only supplied 14 3840 dummies? It's all I had, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's your understanding that Mr. Reed and Ms. Gutierrez supplied the remaining dummy rounds to that show? Yes. Um, the dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez supplied to the set of The Old Way, uh, if you know, do you know where she got them? She got them from Thale. All right. Um, do you, do you source 
a lot of your ammunition from Mr. Swanson. A hundred percent. Actually, uh -huh. no, excuse me, 90 percent. Um, and do you source from Mr. Swanson? And again, not ammunition. Understood. Just dummy rounds and blanks. Okay. Um, do, do you source both dummy rounds and blanks from Mr. Swanson? Dummy rounds, 100% from Joe Swanson. Okay. Um, I think we should look at some pictures, if we can get set up. Mr. Bowles, will you have a look at something with me? Let, I, don't want it, I don't want it to be displayed yet. So here's, just so that you know, So he and I Thank you. Um, Mr. Kenny, do you see the photograph on your screen? I do. Thank you. Um, have you ever had a box of dummies from Mr. Swanson with that label? No, never. And why would you not have a box with this label if you're sourcing your dummy rounds from Mr. Swanson? Well, 1883 was the first period show that um, that I needed uh, 45 long cold dummy rounds for. Uh, prior to that, even though we had done flash, a flashback scene with Tim McGraw and Yellowstone, th there was no call for dummy rounds or the prop master sourced them elsewhere. Um, so I, I just never needed them. And when I did, it was I needed them by the thousands, not by boxes of 50. And so what happened is uh, Joe Swanson, he asked me, do you want me to package them up? I said, no, there's no point, right? It's more work for everybody. So he uh, s uh, sent them to me in bulk. Okay, and so you never had anything like this in your possession? Never. And let's talk about the um, dummy rounds that you provided to the set of rust. Did you provide 45 long Colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? I did. I supplied a single box of, uh, of 50 on October 12th. And the, where did those dummy rounds come from? They had just come off of the day prior um, from the prop truck in Texas. Uh, from 1883. So when you took the dummy rounds that you supplied to the set of rust from the prop truck on 1883, walk us through what you did with them. It, yeah, so the, uh, the Sarah and Hannah um, had issues with a couple of guns and uh, so potentially they needed re uh, replacements. 
there was an issue with the reassembly after cleaning. So I pulled uh, some of PDQ's inventory from the 1883 prop truck uh, to make sure that I had something to replace. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a 45 long Colt chambered gun that matched what they had on, uh, on rust. But I did find one in chambered in 4440. Uh, so I took that gun, a box of 4440 dummy rounds, and also spotted some antiqued uh, 45 long Colt dummy rounds in bulk and put them literally into, and into a double bag of uh, some type of grocery store bag. Uh, and they went, those three items went into my Sprinter van and I drove uh, straight from that set to uh, my PDQ's location in Albuquerque. And when you got to the PDQ location in Albuquerque, um, what did you do with the 45 long Colt dummy rounds that you brought from 1883? They, uh, it's kind of an odd thing to say, but because there were probably a considerable amount of money in firearms in the van at the time that were headed back to California, uh, I slept in the van with, with the guns. Uh, behind closed gates, but that's just what you have to do. So it wasn't until the morning of the 12th that they were brought into into the you know my place uh, PDQ's uh, location in Albuquerque. Okay, and what did you do with them when when you brought them inside? Well, I got rid of the the grocery bags straight away, and I built a small brown cardboard box, and they got poured into there. Uh, Sarah Zachary was running late. Um, and when she showed up, I was able to reassemble and test the gun. And let uh, me stop you real quick, ju just so that we're connecting all the dots. What, why was Sarah Zachary coming to PDQ on, on October 12th? Well, she needed to, to find out whether or not I could quickly reassemble the gun without issue and make sure that it was ready to uh, be used on camera for rust. And were you able to do that? I was. Okay. Uh, but she ended up running probably three hours late, um, and I had nothing else to do. Essentially, I was just headed, waiting to meet with her and, and drive to California. So um, while I was sitting there doing nothing, I looked at these overly antiqued eight um, rounds that had been dipped in a chemical uh, that patinaed not only the lead bullets but also the cases very heavily too heavily and they didn't look right they didn't look right for camera so I just sat there and decided well I'll just see what it looks like after I polish them up with some quato steel wool and that's what I did what I realized though too is that some of the chemicals seemed to have leaked into the case and some of the rattles seemed muddy um, and what do you mean when you say some of the rattles seemed muddy well it's we Joe Swanson, for the most part, stopped using BBs inside the dummy rounds because the uh, the cam the uh, the sound guys could hear them on camera. So if the gun is being manipulated, he could actually hear the dummy rounds rattling around. And there's a number of instances where I can hear dummy rounds in TV and and in movies. Um, where I can spot it, and I'm like, oh, you can hear the dummy rounds rattling. It's kind of interesting. So he switched to using a single piece of number two lead shot, which is an adequate rattle, but it's a little bit muffled. And I, and I suspect what had happened is the chemical had caused some kind of gooey layer, to my best guess. And so I noticed that some of the, they just didn't sound safe to me. It, they just didn't sound like I wanted you know, Hannah and Sarah to have to be dealing with something that seems odd. And so I selected, um, before I sat there and polished each dummy round, I had to make sure one, it rattled before I spent a minute polishing around. If we're talking about a box of 50, plus writing a label on both ends, I sat there with this box for an hour. So they got rattled before they got polished, polished and then re-rattled to make sure they, you know, they would rattle without issue and then individually inserted into the box. Okay, hang on just a second.
Mr. Kenny, I'm going to show you uh, what has previously been entered into uh, evidence as Defendant's Exhibit L43. I'm not going to switch over to the ELMO for this because it requires too many steps and it'll take too long. Do you recognize that? I do. What is this a photo of? It's a photo of the uh, the brown cardboard box that I had just taped up to purposely hold those aged dummy rounds. And you can see in the picture what they look like before being polished with quado steel wool. OK. Um, I am going to show you uh, what has been marked as State's Exhibit 174. Uh, there's no objection to um, admitting this into evidence, and I'd like to publish. All right, State's 174 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Kenny, what is this a photo of? That's the same box. Just it's missing the. I think I, I saw some spent um, blank cases in the box as well as the quadro steel wool. Okay. Um, so when did you take this photograph? I don't recall. Um, is, is this a photograph of the dummy rounds that you provided to the set of rust? That's correct. So it would, it would have to be, the, the picture was either taken on October 12th or after. Okay. Because that, that box and those, those dummy rounds didn't exist until that morning of October 12th. Okay. Um, and after, you, I think you indicated that you rattled them, polished them, and rattled them again. Is that right? Correct. And did you, how did you provide them um, to the set of rust? Were they in a bag? Were they in a box? They were in a, in a white box. Um, with gaffer, white gaffer tape, which is kind of a, a pattern tape, um, very strong. And I hand wrote in blue Sharpie ink on both ends of the box what the contents of it were. All right, I'm going to show you what has been previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 48. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? That is the box of dummy rounds that I supplied to um, to Sarah Zachary uh, on October 12th. So the dummy rounds that we saw in the box, in the in the brown box in the previous photo, uh, you took those and you put them into this box. What what, is, what we see in the in the brown box with the aged dummy rounds is the remainder. Because again, I didn't. I didn't just take fifty rounds. I, I, I took. I would estimate up to nearly a hundred in total. So we've got this is a box that contained fifty dummy rounds, a, aged and polished, um, and the remainder was left in that brown court cardboard box. When you're talking about the remainder. Are you talking about what's shown in Defendant's Exhibit L43? Yes. And the other photo of the brown box without the steel wool, is that, are those the ones that actually ended up in the box and went to rust? No, those are still the remainder. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been... Uh, entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 48A. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? It appears to be that same, uh, the, the foam insert uh, and dummy rounds, the, the polished antique dummy rounds that I gave to Sarah Zachary on October 12th. Although, yeah. one of them appears like it doesn't belong. You talking about this one? I believe it to be that round. Uh, it doesn't look like it's had any aging, and I think in, I've, I've seen it in other evidence photos where they're laid on their side and it stands out. So, let, and hang on just a second. Let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, let me show you. 
uh, what has been previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 166. What's the round you're talking about? That's it. If we look at the top row and, and all the way to the right of the top row, just beneath that, it appears that, that round is inconsistent. He can, yeah, we're showing how he can circle. <laughs> Touch. So that round that I've circled in red does not appear uh, like the others, and I have a tough time thinking that I would uh, provided that round. Okay. Um, and after you gave the box to Ms. Zachary and it was taken to the set of rust. Do you know what was done with it after that? No, I had, even if she left it in her car, I had no idea what she had done with it. Okay. Whether or not they used it or, or not. Okay. I'm gonna show you um, what has been previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 39. Do you recognize that? I've seen this photo before, yes. Um, do you recognize the dummy rounds that appear to be in the belt? Is it hard to tell from it's this photo? It's hard to tell, yeah. Okay, so let's... let's and the, sh uh, the shadows in the photos are, make it difficult as well. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move to um, States Exhibit 40. This is previously entered into evidence. Um, does that photo help? It does. Uh, so, I believe we've heard testimony that these are, from the crime scene uh, specialist, that these are the rounds that were taken out of the belt. Um, does that look, do those look like your rounds? They do. They're, they're definitely similar. Um, a higher resolution on an iPad would be ideal, but they look very similar. Can I guarantee that those are the PDQ rounds? No. It would be difficult to say. Um, uh, casually, yes. Court of law, eh, not okay. so much. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been previously uh, entered into evidence as States Exhibit 49. Do you see that? I do. Um, and do you see that uh, this photograph has a has an extra round up here? I do. Um, are you familiar with what a Denix round is? I am. Um, what, what's a Denix round? Well, it's it's a it's a costume round. Um, what's it, the difference between a costume round and a dummy round? Costume rounds uh, don't rattle. Um, the first off, the Denix round uh, that I've found that I've tested won't chamber in a gun either. The, the cast manufacturing seam is out of spec, so even though it says 45 Colt or 45 Long Colt on the end of it, uh, you actually can't get it to chamber. Um, Hang on just a second. When you said the cast manufacturing seam, can you see that in the photo? I can, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and underline it. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, have you ever had Denix rounds in your um, inventory? No, because it's 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 something that uh, if it if it doesn't rattle and it's coming from a weapon supplier, a vendor, it sets a dangerous precedent that we can say dummy some dummy rounds don't rattle, and there is definitely debate regarding this point. PDQ though, and I have never sent out any dummy round that doesn't rattle, whether or not the primer has been struck by a firing pin. So even if we're talking about, well, we can assume that because the firing pin has hit the primer, it must be a dummy round and there's nothing in it, and that is definitely not the case. Primers will not go off with just one hit of a firing pin. And so 
we and we don't know that that's a purpose built dummy round unless it rattles it's not to be trusted okay um and did did you provide a denix round to the set of rest no and it's your testimony that the Denix rounds actually don't really fit in the revolver. Is that right? The ones that I've tested do not. Okay. Because of the seam. Because of the seam. And it appears overall that that they're oversized very slightly, but it's enough to prevent them from being inserted into a, uh, a revolver. Okay. Um, and do you know a gentleman by the name of Billy Ray? I don't know him personally. We've communicated. Actually, no, excuse me, let me back up. We did meet briefly. We met briefly. He owns a, uh, a similar uh, company providing weapons and props as well as dummy rounds and blanks to productions. I believe he's a set uh, designer. Uh, did you reach out to Billy Ray uh, with regard to supplying dummy rounds to the set of Rust? I did. Uh, again, PDQ, everything we had slated... Uh, uh, in inventory was to be used on 1883. So we didn't have uh, any 45 Colt dummy rounds. So I reached out to Billy Ray by text and asked him if he did have any in stock because uh, they needed more. And did he have any? He did not. But what he did have, which appears on camera, uh, and, and to anyone else, if you were to, to insert these, what he did have into a leather gun belt from three feet away, you wouldn't know what was in that uh, gun belt. And so what he had was speci very specifically, he got back to me and said, I have 98 4440 demi rounds and 423840 dummy rounds. And were those provided to the set of rest? Uh, he met up with Sarah Zachary, and, and that's how they ended up, I'm assuming, on set. And are you the person that connected them so that Ms. Zachary could obtain the dummy rounds? Yes. Um, so, to the best of your knowledge, did Billy Ray provide any 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? No, I mean, he was very specific. I mean, uh, casually you'd say, well, I've got three boxes that'll work. But he went into greater detail. Okay, and, and let, me, let me stop you there. And when you were talking about having a, a 3840 or a, or, or a 4440 dummy round in a gun belt, uh, you said that you, the, the viewer wouldn't know what they were looking at. That's correct. And is that because they look very, very similar to 45 Long Colt? It, yes. So in terms of dummy rounds, we understand that you provided some and we've looked at those photos. You've testified that Billy Ray provided some and you've explained that to us. Was there anyone else who provided 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? Yes. Who's that? That was Hannah. And if you know where did Ms. Gutierrez say that she got the dummy rounds from that she took on to the set of rust? It was the same supply uh, that she had gotten from Thale uh, that she used on the old way. And how do you know that? Common, you know, it was just conversation and text message. She told you? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 175. It's my understanding that there is no objection to this, and I would uh, ask permission to publish. No objection. State's 175 is admitted. You may publish. Uh, sir, have you seen this before? I have. And. What is this? It's a conversation. Who's participating in the conversation? Uh, sorry, I've broken my glasses. Um, 
Yeah, it's a, conver it's a text conversation between myself and Hannah. Um, and what's the, what's the date of this conversation? Again, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses. Uh, October, was it 5th? Do you, do you need some readers? I probably have no, five No, it's I, the new prescription. I broke my glasses and the new prescription is it makes me feel nauseous. So let's see. I'll take a picture. Does that help you? Oh, yeah. October 5th. Okay. Uh, what what are you and Ms. Gutierrez talking about here? Well, we're, we're talking about the, um, let's see. Well, what specifically? Yeah, well, there's a few dates in there. Go ahead and just take a moment and review it, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Now, well, I'm asking you about how she was looking on, you know, for leather. Uh, and what it, wait, when you say leather, what do you mean? Uh, it would be primarily gun belts, but it could also mean bandoliers as well. I don't think, uh, I don't recall that Rust had call for bandoliers. Um, it was just primarily, you know, gun belts and holsters. Each gun belt holds roughly, can hold up to 18 rounds of... Uh, Okay. Dummies. Um, so to, to kind of move through this in this text conversation, uh, does Ms. Gutierrez indicate to you um, that she can't find any of the dummies? Yeah. And she mentions, you know, some of them are still in the belt and in the belt. So hang on. Yep. Um, when she says she can't find any of the dummies, what is your response? Uh, <laughs> sorry about this. What happened to the dummy? Yeah, what happened to the dummy rounds from toe? The which is an abbreviation of the old way. Okay, and what's her response? Some of them are still in the belts. Yeah. Um, and then, what do you explain to her? Uh, something about dummy rounds don't get returned. What 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 are you telling her? Uh, and let me know if you need me to. Do you need me to make it bigger? I mean, I might as well just pull it up on my phone. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I was just explaining, you know, to her that um, she needs to, um, you know, let me know, or as a normal course of business moving forward, um, now that she's no longer underneath her dad's <coughs> wing, that if something gets lost or damaged on set, um, it needs the production needs to pay for it. You you, you said that's an L and D. L and D, what does L &D uh, mean? Lost and lost or damaged. Okay. And in this instance, she's just saying, you know, essentially, yeah, they, you know, they do, they fall, you know, just commonly, the dummy rounds fall out of out of gun belts for stunts, or even maybe picked up for souvenirs by extras or actors. Who knows? Okay. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez responds, and she actually, I think, confirms what you just said. Isn't that right? Yes. She says you never mentioned this. I definitely lost some off of the belts during the action scenes. Right, right. She says maybe like 50 total. I'm not sure. And then she says, so I have to round those up tomorrow and count these? Yep. That was the conversation. Um, and then does she say to you, you both just send me out to do these things and don't teach me right. Shame on both of you. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and you respond, you're a naughty child. I'll let Papa handle this one. Right. Were, were you joking? Partially. <laughs> um, and what was her response? Uh, so what if I need more? You guys <laughs> freaking blow. Okay. Um, so based on uh, States Exhibit 175... Was it your impression uh, that Ms. Gutierrez was bringing dummy rounds that were already loaded into gun belts? Absolutely. Not only that, but we were counting on it. What do you mean you were counting on it? Because there were there, you know, everything else from PDQ was slated for 1883. Uh, in fact, it, some of it wasn't even manufactured yet, so there was just no inventory. And the only way that she was they were going to have you know dummy rounds on rust is by reaching out to other suppliers in the business and they needed them straight away and billy ray happens to be in albuquerque so that's a that's a straight away solution okay was it was it your understanding from that conversation with ms gutierrez 
that the dummy rounds that she was providing to the set of rust were left over from the old way. Yes. Um, I'm going to take you to the, I'm going to take you to October 21st, 2021. Um, Do you recall that day? Yes. And let me ask you, prior to October 21st of 2021, were you ever physically present on the set of rust? No. Um, when was the first date that you were physically present on the set of rust? It was uh, when the sheriff's department executed the warrant on the prop truck. And why did you need to be present for the sheriff's department to execute the warrant on the prop truck? It wasn't that I needed to be um, as much as I felt I, I, I I wanted to be there to facilitate. And how did you intend to facilitate? Well, just to be available to answer questions that, that may have come up. Um, in addition to providing blank ammunition and some dummy rounds to the set of rust, did you also provide firearms? Yes. Approximately how many firearms did you provide, if you recall? Approximately 30. And do you know where the 30 firearms that you provided were being stored? They were being, yes, they were being stored uh, on the prop truck, in the safe. Um, Okay. Yeah. Um, And and let me ask you specifically, did you provide to the set of rust uh, the Pieta 45 that uh, became Mr. Baldwin's prop gun. I did. And where did you get that gun from? Those ga- uh, those guns came from Pieta's. Pieta's an Italian manufacturer, and they supplied, or they, they have a principal, and, and I think it's a single importer located in California. And I purchased them specifically for the Rust Show um, directly from their facility in California. And do you know when you purchased that gun? Uh, was it new or was it used? Baldwin's gun was uh, was brand new, as as were, uh, I believe, it's eleven of the twelve revolvers uh, that were rented to the Rust Production were all brand new. Um. So I'm going to take you back to October 21st. On October 21st, did you find out that there was some sort of an injury that had taken place on set? I did. Um, I missed a call from Sarah Zachary, and quickly thereafter, she sent me a, a single word by text, in all caps, emergency. And when you received that text, what did you do? I called her back within a few minutes. Okay. Um, and, and let me ask this. During that conversation, uh, did you tell Sarah Zachary to do anything with any of the um, dummy rounds or firearms or anything like that on set? No, absolutely not. Um, After your conversation with Ms. Zachary, um, did you call Mr. Reed? I did. I, I, I tried several times to get a hold of him and were by you, phone. Were you ultimately able to get a hold of him? I was. He returned, uh, and I, I recall texting him as well, um, and he did finally return my call. Okay, and I'm not going to ask you what he said during that call. Um, During the filming of Rust, uh, did you occasionally communicate with Ms. Gutierrez? Yes. And was there a time that you and Ms. Gutierrez um, had a disagreement? 
the primary disagreement occurred on October 16th. And what was, what, what was the subject matter of that disagreement without saying what anyone said? Subject matter um, related to an accidental discharge of a, of a blank on the set of rust. Okay. Um, after the disagreement that you had with Ms. Gutierrez on October 16th, did you, if you recall, did you speak to her again before this, b between the 16th and the 21st? No. Um, and why weren't you uh, speaking to her? Was there, was there anything that she did or said during the October 16th conversation that was upsetting to you? Well, it was clear that she was emotional. She sent, um, she sent me a text message uh, back that had uh, a, a number of expletives associated with it. And, uh, and so, you know, I just felt that she needed some space and maybe an apology was due. Uh, and I was just going to give it some time. An apology was due to who? Well, I thought to me. Okay. Um. Understood. Um, sir, did you provide any live ammunition to the set of rust? No. Did you ever give any live ammunition to Sarah Zachary? No. Have you seen photos of the live ammunition that was found on the set of rust? I have. Did you possess any ammunition that looked like that? No. At some point in time after the incident on the 21st, did you become aware that um, you were perhaps being blamed I, yeah, I started to sense um, that there was efforts to redistribute blame or the, the cause of, of this accident. Uh, was, there a, was there a morning news show that you watched that...
Mr. Kinney, um, <clears throat> did you uh, did you see a, a morning news show? I have seen one. Um, I'm talking about a morning news show uh, where Mr. Bulls and Mr. Reed were the guests. Yes, I do remember that. And did anything about their statements on that morning news show cause you to believe that you were perhaps being targeted or blamed? That's difficult to answer. It, it, it started to uh, feel as a, is, uh, I don't know if that's an appropriate word. It started to feel knowing fail and and having been friends with him for a few years at that point i understood who he was and how much he loves his daughter um so i felt like what was about to happen that was the very beginning and that was essentially to ultimately try to pin the live ammunition on the set of rust that somehow it came, you know, through me. Okay. And Mr. Kinney, um, did Ms. Gutierrez, with the assistance of Mr. Bulls, file a lawsuit against you? They did, it was, uh, give or take a couple of days, January 12th of 2022. And when the lawsuit was filed against you, uh, at that point in time, did you fully understand that you were being blamed? At that point, it was quite clear. Okay. Um, uh, what is the status of that lawsuit now? Well, the, the complaint...
Mr. Kinney, was that lawsuit later dismissed? It was. I'll pass the witness. Cross-exam. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Kenny. Good morning. We've met over Zoom, but we've never officially met in person until this morning. Is that correct, sir? It is. Okay. Mr. Kenny, I want to walk you through, uh, to start with, the 1883 set. And I think initially, Thel Reed had brought live rounds in a green ammo can. Is that correct? That's correct. They were, and specifically, they were reloads, yes. And these were reloads, and some percentage of them were Starline brass reloads. Is that correct? Yes, I think it, I would just guess a good percentage, roughly 50% of the cases were Starline. Now, I think you described previously that there were three uh, types of bullet characteristics within those uh, reloads. Is that correct, sir? That is. And will you tell the jury what type, what three types of reloads there were? So again, if we, if we consider that a round of ammunition has four components, and, and commonly people say bullets, and what they were referring to is a, is a, a total cartridge, right? But the bullet is actually the projectile, that single component, which essentially is flying towards whatever target. And Thale had, had brought um, 45 Colt reloads um, that, had, that were made up roughly of, of uh, almost equal thirds, you know. And it was a third, what, what are called semi-wad cutters, the tip of those of those uh, of that projectile sh is shaped exactly like a crayon. It has the exact shape of a of a newly unused crayon. Um, then there was another bullet profile, a truncated cone, mm -hmm. which kind of has a, a spaceship look to it. Uh, and then there was the common, more common and typical found. Um, heavy grain bullet, which is, I, th I think, probably what most people would assume is a bullet when, when they do that. And it just looks like a lump of clay. Uh, uh, and it could be, there are slight variations to those shapes, but it could look like a human head, essentially, that was circular on uh, all the way around the sphere. Okay, kind of uh, like a rounded kind of... Yeah, and they... Uh, uh, and even with a flat point on them, but they, but they seem to be those round-nosed, flat-point uh, versions all seem to be roughly the same. I, I didn't see any variations in those, but, I, but honestly, I just don't recall. I just remember that there were three different type profiles. And the issue that we ran into was that we, uh, they were shooting both lever-action rifles and uh, revolvers at the at the shooting range, um, and specifically, I group the the each different bullet profile into separate boxes, and told the guys that were manning uh, the the prop master in a live fire armor that they had brought on, uh, and the and they had an assistant as well that the uh, that the semi wad cutters would not chamber in the lever action rifles. Um, so best to use those in the revolvers. And ideally, the truncated cone and then the rounded bullets, those could be used in the lever actions. And ultimately, somebody put a, a semi-wad cutter in one of the lever actions and jammed it up. Okay, well in any event, there's three types of bullet characteristics in those reloads that they'll read gets from Joe Swanson, correct? That, that from what I saw, yes. Okay. Now you all have this live training uh, offset. It's at a cowboy training camp in Texas in 1883, correct? Correct. It was, it was nowhere anywhere near a set. It was on, again, Taylor, Taylor Sheridan had set up a, a, a private firing range, live fire area, and no filming was uh, done at that point. Okay, sir, then after that set, you then retained 
the ammo can and the remainder of the live rounds that Dell had brought, correct? No. I, re I retained the, um, the Thale read, yeah, the, the reloads from Thale, but the ammo can was sent once, once the, the, uh, the first I saw of, of the, what was the contents of the ammo can was actually at the firing range on Texas. And at that point, we needed to know how many we had and what variety, because when I opened up the box, it was a jumbled, you know, mm -hmm. distribution of three different types of bullet profiles. So what I did is, is previously I'd gotten from Joe Swanson uh, 10 uh, boxes that were flat, brand new. Uh, they actually had to be assembled. And I loaded the contents from the green ammo box that Thale had brought into those white boxes. Those white boxes went up to the firing line as well as the empty ammo can. And the ammo can was being used for the empty, the spent brass. Okay. So you did retain some of the reloaded live rounds after 1883 completed. After the 1883 cowboy training camp, yes. And those then made their way back to Albuquerque, you've said, to PDQ props, correct? Yes. And you don't know whether those returned, I think you've stated, before October 21st. You said you were hazy on the date, right? Yes. But we do know that you came back to Albuquerque from 1883 on or about October 11th uh, because you met with Sarah Zachary October 12th, correct? Correct. So when you came back, you brought dummy rounds from the set of 1883 to give to Sarah, correct? Correct. And those were 45 long Colt dummy rounds? Correct. Okay. Now, you had a whole group of dummies in 1883 was how many do you think there were 5,000 okay. so out of those 5,000 you brought some back from Miss Zachary um, and at some point you can't tell the jury when those live rounds came back to your place I've never been able to identify the exact date well you also said on direct they were delivered back uh, let me get to the words you used. They were offloaded from your Sprinter van and got moved back to Albuquerque in the bathroom. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's correct. Now, when you said got moved, isn't that you who moved them back? Yes. Okay. So, in reality, you drove them back from 1883, and you can't remember that date at all. No. I, I ballpark it, but it's not, it's not accurate. I, I, can, I have an idea of, of within months or two, or even did, you know, I can't, I can't tell you because I made at least two trips back and forth um, from Texas to Albuquerque, California, back again. It's just, I've just not been able to, to narrow it down. Did you ever go back and uh, when you were sitting down with Hancock in one of these times and sit down with the calendar and try to look at your trip receipts, look at any kind of credit card, try to figure that out? Yes, uh, repeatedly. I've I've probably tried uh, three to five times to see if I can come up with a picture of uh, either the space in you know PDQ space in Albuquerque, something that would indicate when I had brought those back. Uh, I've just been able, unable to. Okay. Now, you said that you brought these back, stored them in the bathroom, and you indicated that that could be a concerning situation if live rounds are stored in the same place as dummies. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. And the reason why you, you said that on direct is that dummies are made to look identical in a lot of respects to live rounds. Yes. Okay. Now, you also had within your place uh, blanks, correct, sir? Correct. Okay. Why would you store live ammo at PDQ at, at all? Well, I've got, you know, self-defense ammunition. Um, you know, it's Albuquerque after all, and that's enough right there. Um, and, you know, I, I deal with weapons that should not be out on the streets. Um, and, I'm, and I'll do what I have to to prevent that from happening. Uh, unfortunately, that's an unfortunate reality. 
So there are there is self defense ammunition and uh, it, the remnants of the 1883 cowboy training camp was there and I, again don't know the date that I brought them back. Okay. Now you um, you keep self defense ammunition it's because it's a dangerous town I think that's what you're saying. And you also keep weapons we've seen in pictures that were out kind of out in the open. Looked like they were cases. You recall that? From the evidence photos? Yes. Well, you're seeing what I want anybody to see that would break in if, you know, because again, it's Albuquerque. If somebody were break in, what are they going to go after first? That's what it's set up as. You don't see in the evidence photos belt fed machine guns, any machine guns, or a lot of other things that were there that are no longer there. Okay, so you had belt fed machine guns too? Oh, yeah. And machine guns at, at this shop as well yes okay so you wanted to people to see the uh and let me just show you defendants exhibit l14 yes sir thank you Is this a picture inside PDQ props? It is. Okay, sir, can you tell the jury uh, these items, what type of firearms those are? Well, they look to be long arms, obviously, because of, of the length. But what's inside those gun socks is a mystery. It could be anything from replicas, non-functioning shotguns, um, Could be anything. So these were there on October 21st. Are you, you telling the jury you, you don't know what was inside those socks? Definitely not. I have hundreds of guns. Okay. Are they are these hundreds of guns inside PDQ props? Or yeah, as well as as replica and rubber as well. And then and replicas are they look exactly like a gun, uh, but they are not. Um, and if I that's not a, is. How do we know that's October twenty first? First of all, that shouldn't be. Not October twenty first. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm getting my date. Yeah. Thanks for the month. Okay. This was the month after in November. This is search warrant photos. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I apologize. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So that was in November. Um, Mr. Kenny, what is this on the? Are these some rounds on the ground here? Can Everything in this room are going to be blanks or dummy rounds. Okay, but I'm, and I see them kind of laying in bags on the, the ground. Is that correct? Yes. So did you have any kind of, oh, first of all, let me, before I ask you that, you have a, a lot of boxes stacked up on the, um, the shelves here. Do you see that? Yes, and that, that shelf holds um, entirely um, blanks. Okay. Did, did you have any sort of written inventory system? For all your boxes and occasionally I would go through and and make a list of what I had. It was it was casual, you know. What do I need? You know, Swanson, Joe Swanson would say, "Hey, I'm I'm running off a, a batch of two two three blanks and uh, or nine mm, uh, whatever it was." And and if I was on the road, it would be helpful to kind of have an idea about that. But there was, there's no spreadsheet of, of inventory that I kept. Okay, and when you say casual, was it was this kind of was it written on a piece of paper? Or? It was. It was eight and a half by eleven. I would end up, uh, you know, with two or three eight and a half by elevens because it's not only we're not just talking about you know nine millimeter, right? We're talking about nine millimeter that is going to be what we use in the industry. Anything from a, a solid plug load. And in a solid plug load, you can have 10, 10 variations. And then we have eighth flash, quarter flash, half flash, full flash. So um, you had to know what your inventory is by memory for the most part. And occasionally, 
you know, if, if, if inventory got too high in one area, I'd say, well, definitely don't, you know, if Joe says, hey, do you need any of this? Respond no, because it, it just doesn't make sense from a small business standpoint. And, and you said um, inventory uh, through memory. Um, I'm gonna show you Defendant's L16. It's just one example. Were, were you able to remember at any given time each number of each of those types of boxes? Well, when I'm, if I'm handling it on a daily basis, yes. Deficiencies mostly. Well, and for example, when you have to invoice, um, like the rest set, um, do you have any procedure that kind of tells you how you're going to invoice that? Typically what I'll do is, is very quickly, uh, usually movie productions, television productions are last minute. And oftentimes the invoicing become, you know, comes a week or two after the service has been provided. Um, and so oftentimes I'll quickly jot down what it is that's being uh, sent, take a picture of it, and oftentimes things go, you know, if they're shipped, everything goes overnight. So it's it's a last minute kind of business. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach? I'll show this. Sir, I'm gonna approach and show you defendants EE and FF. And I'll ask you if you recognize these two documents. I do. Can you Readers. No, that's okay. Yep. And what are those documents? This is an invoice uh, made out to Russ Production uh, with Sarah Zachary here as well. And which, can you look in the back of the one you just looked at and see what the sticker number is uh, on the back of the page? Just flip it over. The yeah, that little sticker, FF, does that say that? That says FF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you just read for the record from FF, and what is EE? The other exhibit? We haven't introduced you. No, I was just going to ask to move them in, Your Honor. Just have them identify EE. Okay. So FF is an invoice for uh, blink ammunition as well as dummy rounds. Okay, and is that your invoice, sir? Yes, it is. And is it the same for EE? If you could take a look at that. And this EE is an invoice for guns, replicas, uh, rubber guns, gun bags and socks. Okay, and, don't, and not get into the contents of it. You just recognize that, do you not? I do, okay. yeah. I would move for the admission of those two exhibits. E, e and F, F are admitted. You may publish. Thank you, Your Defendants. So, Mr. Kenny, I'm first going to show you defendants E, E. And you were just telling the jury, uh, just uh, can you just summarize this and don't go into every item? Sure, this is the um, gun, replica, and rubber invoice to the Rust production from PDQ. Mr. Bowles, hold the exhibit real Okay, um, Mr. Kenny, if you can just summarize that uh, for the jury. 
So that invoice is from PDQ to the rest production for firearms, replica firearms, as well as rubber firearms. Okay, and now I want to show you, and this is what you, and the one we just saw, this is what you uh, supplied to rest, correct? Correct. Okay. Now I want to show you the Fenix FF. And if you can summarize this document. It's a um, invoice from PDQ to Rust Production for blanks, blank ammunition, as well as dummy rounds. Okay, and then if I want to show you the second page of that. And what does that say in the second page? It says dummy rounds, 4440 slash 45 LC long colt and 12 gauge. So is this uh, the line where you um, you invoiced for those 45 long colt rounds? It is. Okay. And so you, you put this together in a group with the other types, correct? Yes. And the, the, number, the numbers on the left column, so you, you start at your dummy rounds, 44, 40, 45, then there's a number, 200. Is that the quantity? That is the quantity. And then there, the price per item is right next to that. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Now the, so these, um, these dummy 45 and other dummies, did you rent these to Rust? I did. What was listed there is not inclusive of actually what was provided to set. Um, there were some, as I recall, there were some 44 Henry dummy rounds. Um, Possibly some 4570. I don't recall exactly. Uh, so w were there other invoices? No. Okay. So there were certain items that you did not invoice for. That's correct. Okay. And that, did that also include um, what's called primed cases? No. Primed cases, cases would not be uh, on, in a in the dummy round line of the invoice, that would be that would be listed out separately, because one is one is a consumable, uh, the other one is a rental. And prime cases would be a consumable. And I want to talk a little bit about that, but you provided Sarah Zachary some primed cases, uh, for rust, correct? Not that I recall. I mean, I'd have to look at the invoice. What is a primed case? A prime case is 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 simply that it it's um, it's a ammunition case that has a primer uh, without gunpowder. Um, typically, they Joe Swanson crimps the end uh, because what happens is that they're too long. If he doesn't crimp the end, they're too longer to actually be functional in a revolver. Um, and they're, they're simply, you know, like a loud cap gun when they go off. Uh, they're good for training. Uh, they're good for uh, around horses and kids. Uh, and certain armorers will rig them up in theater as well. Live theater will use them with talcum powder um, for an effect with minimal noise and for also for close proximity. Do you recall telling um, Detective Hancock when you interviewed with her that you had given a number of prime cases to Sarah and it will be interesting to see what color primers they have? No, I don't recall that. If I showed you your interview transcript, would that refresh? It, it would help, yeah. Okay. It's page 32.
I can have that there. Mm. Did you indeed tell Detective Hancock that you had given a number of primed cases to Sarah? Well, it's interesting because it, it says prime cases, and that I would have said primed. Um, I, I never say prime cases. It just sounds like you're ordering some off of Amazon. Uh, so I don't recall that conversation. I'm not. I'm not. I don't even know what I'm referring to in that uh, in that conversation. Well, do you recall that there was discussion about um, those being there and that you looked for a picture to show Hancock? No, I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall stating that chances are they'll all have the same color primer? I this conversation, I just don't remember the particulars of this conversation with, with Detective Hancock. But do you recall at all, regardless of the conversation, that Sarah Zachary had primed cases on the set of Rust? If they're on the invoice and it's, and it's a, a, a dummy, or excuse me, it's a blank round and I would include a primed case in a in a blank round invoice because um, again it's it's a consumable um, I would not be surprised if if they got prime case uh, blanks let's call them well sir don't you know that don't you know you provided that to, to Sarah Zachary no it was two over what two and a half years ago but this was a, I mean, traumatic event for everybody. You talked to, you, you, you remember that, don't you? I remember it being traumatic, yes, no, you absolutely. Remember, you remember providing those cases because you discussed it for five pages in this. No, I don't remember. Do you recall during this conversation as well that you called a man named Troy Teske? I've called Troy Teske a number of times in the last six years. I'm, I'm asking you specifically, during the interview with Detective Hancock, November 1st, do you recall that you, in, to, you called Troy Teske? In the interview room, yes, with, yeah. with Detective, at the, yeah, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, yes. Yes, because he was at lunch, you called him, you were trying to reach him. I, yes, now I, I understand what you're talking about. Okay. And do you recall also calling Joe Swanson while you were sitting down with, with the detective? I do. And do you recall when you asked Joe Swanson whether he had put these in boxes, uh, how many rounds he had made in total, he said about 700, uh, is what you said. Do you recall saying that he had made about 700 rounds? I have a vague recollection of, of the conversation with, okay. with Detective Hancock, yeah. And as you're talking to Joe Swanson and you ask him if they were in the box or the green ammo can, do you recall he's on the phone with you and you're asking if they were in the green ammo can and you say, Okay, uh, Mr. Kenny, do you recall you said, as you're on the phone, shit, shit, shit. I'm like, oh God, well, I mean, still trying, damn. You recall yeah. saying that? Vaguely, yes. You also recall saying, uh, you said it twice, you said, shit, 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 well, she still didn't do her effing job. Do you recall saying that? That sounds like me. So when you find out, and I don't want to get into what Mr. Swanson told you, but when you find out whatever you find out on the phone, you say shit, shit, shit twice. Mm. Why did you say that? I think I was worried that it was going to be 
some of these rounds that that Thale had given to Troy Teske and had been using, um, you know, to shoot right, He's shooting live rounds, that somehow they migrated in in some of Thales leather or, um, you know, through Hannah in some way, and that, again, we were going to be here saying Joe Swanson live, live ammunition when he's primarily 99.9% .9 of the time he just provides movies and television shows with blanks and dummy rounds. And that's an uncomfortable situation for Joe Swanson. So you just gave a long explanation, and you just um, kind of blamed, tried to blame Hannah in that, didn't you? Just now, how did I do that? I don't. Well, you, you gave the implication that you were worried that this was going to be some that Bill had, and Troy was shoot, and and again, that that's to try to link it to Hannah, isn't it? No, no, okay. just to, just telling you. My thought process at that point, trying to figure out where did this, where did the rust live ammunition come from, and was it going to, you know, point back to Joe Swanson? Okay. And do you recall on July 11, 2023, you interviewed with myself and Miss Morrissey? Uh, you call that, sir? Yeah, the the Zoom meeting. Yes, I recall that. And do you recall when I asked you the same question? Shit, shit, shit. Why did you say shit, shit, shit? You said, I don't know. And that was the extent of your answer. Do you recall that? Yes. So back in July 11, 2023, your memory, would you agree with me, would be fresher to that time frame when you said it than it would be now? Well, not if, if I had reviewed things or, or something else jogged my memory of that event or, you know, because it was a highly, it was a, an emotional time. And that the you know I found that largely when things are emotionally charged, um, there there kind of needs to be uh, some kind of gateway between the present and recollecting how I felt and, and the way things were at that point in time. And, and I understand, but you would you agree with me? You gave a different answer on July 11th. I don't know than you do today. I don't know if I don't know is really an answer other than at that moment in time after us discussing it I hadn't thought about saying shit four times in an interview with a detective the rounds again that went to 1883 came back at some point to your place again some of those reloaded rounds from Joe Swanson were Starline brass so the, the 1883 cowboy camp training camp, just to be specific. Yes, some of those Thale Reed, Joe Swanson reloads came back to PDQ in Albuquerque. And as well, uh, some of your dummy rounds also were Starline brass, correct? Correct. And they had nickel primers? Correct. Okay. And the live rounds found on set that were Starline brass also had nickel primers, correct? On the set of rust? Yes, sir. From the evidence photos, yes, those were nickel primers. As well? Yes. Okay. And in addition to providing replica firearms, did you provide rubber firearms to the set? To the set of rust, yes. Okay. Did you provide uh, over 3,000 rounds of ammo? I don't know what the total of, if we're referring to bl uh, blanks. Bl too. Yeah, blanks, yeah. 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 I don't know what the total is of blanks to rust. I've never totaled it out. Uh, well, other than the invoice, that would have been the only time. Okay. When you would get a request from Sarah Zachary uh, for additional rounds that were needed, would she come pick those up from you at your place? I think once, uh, once the initial supply of blanks and uh, and firearms were provided to to Sarah there was only one other occasion that I can recall Sarah coming and getting anything for rust from me which was on October 12th okay and do you recall Sarah and Hannah coming before rust started to your place I do and at that time didn't you give Hannah her leathers 
as well as firearms and ammunition. I, yeah, I vaguely recall that, uh, yeah, that she got that done. Because, in fact, Hannah had mailed you uh, the leathers back from the old way at the end of that set. You recall that? Yeah, she had shipped uh, everything from Montana to uh, me, in, uh, me in Texas. And so when you received those in Texas and the leathers and everything else, you brought them back to PDQ Props? That's correct. They uh, were, the leathers were in the same box. They never got pulled out. Um, the replica firearms did get pulled out, but the rest of the leathers remained in the box. Okay, sir. Then you gave that to uh, Sarah and Hannah for their use on the rest set. Is that fair to say? Well, whatever she was going to do with it was up to Hannah um, and Thale. Okay. Um, but you, do you know they got used on the rest set? I don't know that. I, okay. I'm just, I can assume that's, that's where that leather went to. Okay. Now I want to ask you uh, some questions about the dummy rounds that you answered earlier. Um, you did indicate that dummies that do not rattle can be dangerous. Is that right? Dummy rounds that do not rattle are not dummy rounds to me. Okay. And I think you've said because it, it is dangerous when an armor is trying to figure out maybe in a high-speed environment, maybe things are going on, you're trying to distinguish between a live round and a dummy, and it will not rattle. Uh, it doesn't rattle. Didn't you describe that as being a dangerous situation? Well, certainly, because you don't. You, it's like a firearm that you can't check is, is unloaded. You have to assume that it's loaded or that the, the round is live and it's not a dummy round. Yes, sir. And you also stated that you would not source those type of rounds like Denix rounds that do not rattle, right? That's correct. And it's one of the things you said that you would not be in favor of having a mixture of dummies, some that rattle, some that don't. That's a dangerous situation, isn't it? Well, it's, it's you know, I work with with prop crews a lot. They're not specialists, they're not armorers, but they are charged with the responsibility of having gun belts and dummy rounds on set. And if they get the idea that dummy rounds don't necessarily have to rattle, bad precedent, deadly precedent. It sets a deadly precedent, and on this set on Rust, you're aware that there were those types of a mixture of different types of dummy rounds, are you not? Well, I, I'm not a, I wasn't aware of that. that because well, you weren't before, but you are now having reviewed the pictures. Yeah, the Denix round is a costume round that doesn't rattle. Okay. So after you reviewed the pictures from set, you're now aware that there was a dangerous mix of types of dummies, some that rattled, some that didn't. Well, a Denix round is not dangerous. It sets a, a dangerous precedent. Okay. You know. And I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not saying you can fire it. I'm just saying, in your words, it can set a dangerous precedent. Yeah, Is it's, right? yes. It's not an ideal situation. Not, not at all. Okay, sir, I want to talk about your, your interactions with Detective Hancock in this case. When the case started, do you recall you had a um, meeting or call with her maybe the same day as the shooting incident? No, I don't. I don't. With Detective Hancock? Yes. On, the, on October 21st? Mm -hmm. Don't recall it at all. I don't think it happened. Okay. Do you recall that on the course of time after that shooting incident, you called Detective Hancock over 40 times? Yeah, it sounds about right. Do you think it might have been higher than that? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, and during that time, you're sharing information with her. She's sharing information with you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And doesn't she share you materials from the investigation at times? The first time that I think she showed me anything was when they were executing the search warrant on the prop truck. She was showing me, I think they were black and white, grainy photos. Okay. That was the first time I saw anything. Now, do you recall providing uh, Detective Hancock some of the live rounds before the execution of the search warrant? I did. So you provided her some, and was that in a bag, or how did you give those to her? Well, interestingly enough, they came from that jammed lever-action rifle, and they happened to be uh, the semi-wad cutter live rounds. Uh, they were in a small Benelli shotgun choke bag, and I had written on there in, in black ink live, and there were between five and seven, I believe. 
that I gave her. Okay. And you, you volunteered those to her, and, and she took them. Then they came to search after that. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And again, there was a month time frame or so, roughly, between the shooting incident and that search of your place. Yeah, I believe it was over a month. Because it, it was after Thanksgiving. So, yeah, over a month. Did, did you have any inkling or thought that they were going to come search? No, not at all. Even though you had been in contact with the detective and other people before that, you knew they were investigating? I knew they were investigating. I had no reason to believe that they would be executing a search warrant on my business. Now, did you provide your DNA to Detective Hancock? No, I did offer it, though. You offered it? Yes. And they did not take you up on that? That's correct. Um, and they did not take your fingerprints either, did they? Well, my fingerprints are in the system already um, through the, if you're a federal firearms licensee, that's just part of the licensing is that your, your fingerprints go into the, the digital federal system. And, and I understand that, sir, but my question was, did, you, did they take your fingerprints? Again, no. Okay. Well, they didn't take it the first time. That was somebody else. That's true. Okay. Um, now, I want to ask you uh, a different topic. After this, you were asked on, on direct if after this October 16th accidental discharge, you had had an argument with uh, Ms. Gutierrez Reed. Do you recall that? It, by text message, yes. Okay. And you recall after that that you wanted to fire Ms. Gutierrez Reed? It wasn't that I wanted her fired uh, because it wouldn't be for me to fire her. Um, she can tell me to go to hell all day long and it, it wouldn't make a difference to the rust production. Um, it doesn't, you know, I've got five sisters and two daughters, I'm used to it. Um, so if rust production is happy and they were you know, they, Sarah Zachary said she's a great armor. Uh, that I've seen the, she, the defendant, Hannah, she sent me the text message that the director had sent her after a big shootout on blank ammo shootout. Big, big and, shootout. And Mr. Kinney, I, 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 that my question was pretty simple. And okay. Let me ask it again. Okay. Um, you, you just testified that you did not want to get rid that you did not want to fire Hannah is that your testimony it's it's not that I wanted her fired she was doing a horrible job at props that was an issue um, okay you answered my question and I I just want to know is he it's a real it, I, I had mixed feelings about it and okay. I think that's why you know in fact I reached out to two common friends with fail saying this is the situation you know okay well did do you recall in your interview on November 1st stating she was just being an idiot I wanted I wanted Sarah to get rid of her collectively yes I mean you know even now frustrated with her but at the same time you know understand well you know what she's up against so it's a mixed bag of emotions, and 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 ultimately right. was Sir, not my, my question. Call. Was 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 did you remember stating that? Oh yeah. Okay, that that's what I asked. Now, uh, do you also recall in the July 11th interview stating, "Well, I wasn't going to work with her again in the future," so you wanted her fired. I just again it 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 was there were some mixed emotions and uh, in the situation if I wanted her, if I really wanted her fired I could have gotten her fired. Let me ask you that if you um, you could have gotten her fired you could have talked to um, somebody on set who was your contact on set? It would have been. Uh, 
Well, Gabrielle Pickle was uh, actually Angel Nijem was my first contact with a, with production at Rust. And then it was Gabrielle Pickle, um, line producer, unit production matter, manager, Roe Walters. Those would have been the ones to to fire her. Sarah was Sarah Zachary was she was willing to work with Hannah and and get the movie finished. And yes. Why don't we see you back here at one o'clock? Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. All rise.
please continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Kenny, uh, before lunch, we talked about that you uh, had approximately 125 live rounds from the 1883 set that came back. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And you also testified that the state took 10 rounds, 10 live rounds total from your plays, correct? Mm, I don't recall that. No, they, from the 45 Colt ammunition, they took all of them. And there was, we've seen the pictures, there was 10 total on, on what, what was shown today. Do you recall that testimony? 10 live? Yes. Oh, yes. Mr. Kenny, do you have reloading equipment? I don't. What? I don't. Did you recall in the interview on July 11th, 2023, <clears throat> I asked you if you had any reloading equipment and you said, I do? Possibly in California, possibly. Okay, does that mean you do have reloading equipment? Well, PDQ doesn't doesn't have reloading equipment and we don't reload. Okay, sir, but do you recall when I asked you, now do you have any reloading equipment? Your answer was, I do. Personally, in California, there may be. I haven't seen it in years. Okay, and, and you know how to um, to convert a dummy round from uh, into a live round, don't you? Hypothetically. Yeah, because hypothetically, don't you recall telling Detective Hancock that if the camera crew, and let me just get the wording so I don't misquote it. <clears throat> um, if the camera crew wanted to send a little going away present, um, and then you describe the process. Do you recall that? No, I don't recall it. If you, if I showed this to you, would it, would it refresh your memory? Sure. Okay. So it's going to be on this page and then the following page. Okay. How far do you want me to read down? Just uh, the highlighted portions. Okay. It does. So now do you recall having a conversation with Detective Hancock about how one could turn a dummy into a live round? Yes, yes. And can you tell Jerry, how would you do that? <clears throat> well, the easiest thing would be to have reloading equipment, press out the inert primer, um, in first, but if we imagine a, a, a dummy round where the bullet is actually pressed into the case um, and you had an inert primer, you'd need a, a fairly complicated setup of, of reloading equipment. You need, you need either a kinetic bullet puller uh, to remove the bullet from the case. If you used a set of pliers, it would mangle the bullet and prevent seating afterwards in a, in a die if you had reloading equipment. So you'd have to somehow remove the bullet from the case, 
Uh, we're assuming there's a BB or a number two lead shot rattle that would have to be removed. You'd have to have um, a decapper to press out the, um, the, the inner primer. Um, and then you'd have to, you could use the same bullet, uh, assuming it wasn't mangled, and you'd have to have a live primer and a charge of powder and then be able to have the appropriate dye and seed it to the appropriate depth as well as putting in again the fresh primer the primer you know primer uh, primer installer okay and then you'd have to get the proper amount of grains of powder in there as well yes okay and, and what would that generally be well historically i, I think in the pre-1900 era it would be roughly 28 grains of powder from memory, if that's correct. And then it, it depends on the powder as well, um, all the way up to the case capacity, which means essentially uh, you fill it up all the way and maybe even press the bullet into the case so it's compacting the powder. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want to go over something you said before lunch on the leathers. You said that these were mailed back from the old way movie by Hannah to yourself. <clears throat> and that you provided these to her, correct? Yeah, they were shipped back via FedEx. And they were shipped in a box from the old way, and then you never removed them from the box, correct? That's correct. So, but then, would you agree with me then that those leathers were then used on the rust set? I don't know that. All I, all I know is that that box, and, and I... I'm unaware of the quantity in there. I did take a photo at the time. Uh, I don't know how many were in there and whether or not they used them. Okay, so you opened it up and you looked in it. <laughs> yes, I opened it up. I took a picture. Okay. With regard to the prop truck search, we didn't talk about that yet. When you went to the set on October 27th, you already had the code to the safe, correct? Yes. And Sarah had given that to you? Yeah, she sent it to me by text. Sarah was technically your employee um, of PDQ Props, correct? Sure. She was the representative of PDQ for the Rust production. And she's the one that, that called you right after the shooting incident. You all talked for 30 seconds to a minute. Is that right? It was a very quick conversation, yes. And you, your testimony under oath is that you did not tell her to throw any of those rounds away. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. But then she did throw them away. I learned about that months later. Yeah. And did you know that guns had been transported from the cart? <clears throat> did you? No. Did you tell her to do that? No. Okay. Did you train Sarah before she worked on Rust? I did. And you trained her in, in what? In gun safety or what? Yeah, the basics of, of using uh, blank adapted guns and um, and blanks and dummy rounds uh, on a set. And I take it you never trained her to throw away dummy rounds after a scene. Oh. Well, I don't recall that conversation or even indicating at what point you would want to throw away dummy rounds. Because they're rented, right? <clears throat> they are rented. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, now, you also gave Hannah um, shells on the, on the Old Way movie, spent shells. Do you recall that? Spent shells? No. You didn't provide her two bags of spent shells? No. You knew that <clears throat> Joe Swanson load trail boss type powder. Uh, that's one of the powder he uses, correct? After, sometime after a meeting with Detective Hancock, um, it, it, trying to chase trace down the the origin of the of the live rounds found on Rust, that was part of the questioning of that I did call him and, and say, do you recall? And, the, and don't get into what he said. The, okay. But your impression after it was that your understanding is he loads trail boss powder. There were, yes. Okay. You also remember telling Detective Hancock after you called Troy Teske that he was willing to provide a box and a half of, of reloads, the same batch from Joe Swanson? 
I remember that conversation. Uh, I don't remember the quantity of what she was willing to provide. Okay, so in any event, whatever the quantity was, you knew that Troy Teske had rounds from the same batch of live reloads from Joe Swanson. That's what I understood. And you understood that he was willing to provide those, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I want to show you, sir, uh, some of the pictures that have been introduced, and I want to go over these with you. Um, first one, Mr. Kenny, is defendant's L18, and I want to show you this photo. Can you tell the jury what this depicts? It depicts a uh, shelf uh, at PDQ's office in Albuquerque oh, with uh, a blank supply. Okay, now... I want you to look at the box at the top uh, that says, let me see if I can zoom in, 30 Mauser. See that? Yes. Does that appear, the font, similar to the font on the box that we saw earlier? It was in Lieutenant Benavides' vehicle in the set, set of rust? Well, I recognize that as, as a Joe Swanson label. And you have Joe Swanson labels then in your business, correct? Yes. Now, the other thing that I've noticed on some of these photos, and I'll show you, but that some of them have JS, some of them don't. Is that a fair statement? I've, I noticed the JS. I don't notice when it's omitted. How do you get those labels? Do you make those labels? No, that's all a Joe Swanson uh, manufacturer and supply. Okay. I want to show you defendant's L15, and that's, um, we've seen this earlier on a different angle this is more of a close-up what are the boxes to the right of the shelf there are there are uh, well I know that shelf fairly well there's a mixture of uh, on top we see in a, a collection of what appear to be 12 gauge uh, blanks Okay, and then how about the boxes underneath? And I'm going to point to these, these boxes in here. Yeah, uh, more, more blanks in, uh, stored in bulk. Just stored together in bulk? Yes. Okay, Mr. Kenny, how about these loose rounds in the uh, bag up here by the firearms? You see those? Not loose, they're in a baggie, are they? Yeah, again, stored in bulk. Uh, for memory, I think they're five, 500 per bag, approximately. What type of rounds are those? Uh, they look to be 223. Are you, are you certain? No. Okay. And how about um, at Defendant's L2? What is this uh, scene? Oh, geez, sorry. What is this scene here, Defendant's L2? That's in the backyard. And what of, are these? of PDQ's headquarters, or PDQ's space in Albuquerque. What are all the boxes uh, there for? They're just waiting to be thrown out. Okay. And, uh, you know, how long they've been sitting there before they were thrown out? Well, in that pile is, one of the boxes is from uh, the shipment of the, of the new guns from Pieta. Um, okay. So oh. some of it very recent. From and Pieta before the movie? From before the movie, correct. Okay, so that would have been in October, early October, um, when you got that Pieta. So this was late November. Yeah, so they've been there roughly a month. Month and a month, month and a half. Okay. Um, how about Defendant's L5? Can you tell the jury what this is? Is that... It's the same view, the same stack of boxes looking to the side gate exit entry. Okay. Sir, how about the Fennets L6? Can you tell the jury what, what's in that picture? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uh, empty gun cases. Some of them are populated uh, with guns and other props. Underneath, there's a bunch of locked cabinets with, uh, with firearms um, and other various props inbound. 
and outbound. Okay, so some of these are live or real weapons? Yeah, primarily primarily these are going to be live. I'm going to say 90%. There's also the possibility that there are other things in there that are inert or replicas. Okay, okay let me show you Defendant's L10 now. And do you describe what room is this in PDQ? That would be the coffee room. Okay. And that's the coffee room. Now, is there any ammunition stored in the coffee room? No. Okay. I want to show you now L32. And if you can tell the jury what this picture is. That is the bathroom with blanks and appears to be at the very bottom is indicated live, uh, live ammo of the gray bins. And so you've got <clears throat> live ammo, and then on top of that, do you have uh, blanks or dummies? Those are all blanks. Okay. So you've got them, and they're not in the same container in this picture, but you've got them all stacked up on each other, correct? Yes. Okay. And is that something that you would commonly do, is store this live ammo in the bathroom? No, not commonly. It was just... Uh, short on time and offloading the sprinter and got to put it somewhere quick and get back to Texas or California or whatever it might be. Okay. Okay, Mr. Kinney, then I want to show you if you recognize Defendant's L35. That's a box that says 45 LC. Do you recognize that? Yes. And, and what is that? That is a box that, um, that I populated with Dale Reed's 1883 Cowboy Training Camp Live Ammo. Okay, now on that particular box itself, it's not marked live, is it? No. Okay. And so the rounds around it and in the box, do you know if these loose rounds are live? They, I would assume that they are live. Okay. Do you recall um, what the Finnett's L40 is? No, the Stale Reed's Green Ammo Box. And that was found in PDQ crops? Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Then I want to show you earlier, this is the Finnett's L43. Earlier, you talked about this photo. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay, and I think you said that this, this was uh, the dummies you had provided, correct? Yeah, before polishing and, and populating in the, yeah, in the white box provided to Sarah Zachary. Yes. Okay. Now, as you look at this photo, this round up here, isn't that a blank? Yeah, that's a spent blank. And then how about this round right here, right around point here? That's another spent blank. Okay. So this was not all dummies. This also had spent blanks in it. Correct. Okay. Now the sheriffs did not seize this. They did not seize these at the time of the search. Were you aware of that? Yes. Uh, I want to show you Defendant's D, D, uh, and if you can tell the jury what, what this is. That's a maintenance ban uh, bench. A bench to do what? Maintenance of firearms. Okay. So this is where you maintain the firearms? Yeah, there's gloves there and uh, you have, you have some cleaning products. That would be one of them, yes. What are... These uh, rounds down here, they look like shotgun shells, but what are these? Uh, from memory, yeah, from memory that was a, um, that was a project on a previous film. Okay, and then you have rounds in the back here, do you, do you know what those are? I can't see, uh, yeah. the, 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 so see. Okay, dummy. I see dummy blanks. Uh, shall I circle it? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Right there. Um, yep. It says 45 ACP dummy blanks. Now, when you say dummy blanks, is that another type of round or are there dummies and blanks? Uh, instead of chambering a dummy round, uh, it, it's better to chamber a dummy blank, an inner one piece extrusion. And there's it's, it's a safer way of doing it if. You know, we've, we have a call at some point in the action where somebody needs to chamber around that is inert. Um, 
dummy rounds are problematic in semi-automatic and automatic firearms. And if upon repeated chambering, the components can come loose. So Joe Swanson came up with this invention, which is a dummy blank. Dummy blank, okay. And what what is these um, tools in the back, the yellow and green? Uh, one is an Allen wrench set. The green one is a Torx uh, set. And what do you use those for? Uh, again, it would just be, actually, the yellow handled ones are, are used commonly to attenuate the flash of semi-automatic and fully automatic weapons. Defendant's BB, is that, what is that equipment or device right here? Those are a pair of vices, small vices. Is that your gun maintenance table as well? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, now, defendant's S, is this, do you recognize that? I do. And is this your box as well? It is. Are those live rounds? Yes. Well, the box, I remember writing 45 Long Colt and thinking, this is odd not to write dummy or blanks or specify what it is. It's 45 Long Colt because it's 45 Long Colt live. And I don't need to write live, it's just live. 45 Long Colt, okay. Yeah. And defendant's V, can you tell the jury what that is? Those are Joe Swanson blanks. Okay. Defendant's AA, um, again, we have those Mauser boxes at the top of that font, and that's a Joe Swanson font, is that right? Those are definitely Joe Swanson boxes and fonts okay. that, he, that I commonly see from him. Okay. Um, this is defendant's Y, and again, let me show you the overall picture, but you see that? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what that is? That's that same wooden shelf holding uh, blank crowns. Okay, and again, we have at the top these 300 blackout. Is that the Joe Swanson font? It is. Okay. And you see some of these uh, boxes, they got the JS, like on the 9 millimeter. I see that. Yeah, okay. That's what I was noticing before. But you said there are some of them and some of them. Well, I, I commonly, I, I notice, bless you, I see the JS, but I do, if it's omitted, um, it, it, it's not, you know, it's just not something I notice. Okay. And I want to show you Defendant's X now. What is this picture? That's that same wooden shelf. Okay. And Defendant's W. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that's the top of the uh, uh, the black bookshelf that's adjacent to the wooden cabinet. Okay, defendant's Z. Can you tell us what that is? Same wooden shelf. Okay. What are the rounds on the right in this bin here? Those are small bags of... Um, 25, more than likely it's 25 ACP and 32 ACP uh, bags of, of blanks. Okay. Defendants, you again, these tools? <coughs> it's the same, yeah, same Allen wrench set and Torx wrench set on top of the maintenance table. Okay, defendant CC, you see that? I do. And this box over here, is that a Joe Swanson? It is. Okay. And these spent shells, um, what are those? What caliber? I can't tell from this photo. Okay. Do you know what these spent shells were, were doing here? I don't recall. Oh, those those are the kind of thing that can be reloaded, correct? Yeah, unless unless a case is torn, or it's become brittle and started to fracture, you can reload it. This is defendant's T, and that's um, is this the live ammo from eighteen eighty three? That box. It is. Okay. 
And I want to show you defendants in 27. And I'm going to show you that upright, but then I'm going to turn it around. Is that your writing on the blue box? It is. Okay. And defendants in 29, is that that same box? It is. It's one side or the other. Because, yeah, both have a label just like that. Okay. Both ends. Okay. Now, a couple more questions on the prop truck that I forgot to ask you. When you were going there, do you recall telling Sarah um, to put a piece of tape over the safe? Yes. Okay. And and what was the purpose of that? Well, I just did. I wanted to make sure that nobody got into the safe before um, the law enforcement uh, showed up. One last series of questions on the um, disagreement that Hannah and Sarah had, you were talking about earlier, uh, and that was over the negligent discharge, or accidental discharge, you called it? Accident, accidental discharge, yes. Okay, Sarah, do you recall telling Hannah that um, Sarah was her boss and not to push it? Yes. And you were basically telling her to back off, reporting anything? Okay. Shoot, I'm sorry, jeez. Sorry, Judge. Siri picked up this thing. Um, do, do you recall telling um, Hannah something like um, uh, to back off because she wanted to report to production? It wasn't that she wanted to report it to production because Sarah had already had already reported it herself. That was the issue. Okay, but in any event, you told her that she should just move on. Yeah. Okay. okay, Your Honor, may I have just one moment? Okay. Redirect. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Kenny, is it your testimony that the 45 caliber live rounds at PDQ were reloads? To my knowledge, yes. And did any of those live rounds that were taken from PDQ have the same projectile shape as the projectile on the live rounds from the set of rust? No. Uh, you spoke to Mr. Bowles. You indicated that um, you had, of the, of the live rounds that, that you took uh, to the set of 1883, there were three um, three projectile types, is that correct? It is. Did all three of those types come back to PDQ? Once we were, no, well, I'm unaware because once we were done with the cowboy training camp, I never went into that box again or even the, the smaller white boxes, into the, the gray bin or the smaller white boxes. So I didn't take an inventory after we were done. And the gray bin that you had marked live ammo, was all of the live ammo that you had at PDQ inside that bin? Yes. 
what, excuse me, the, all the live ammo from 1883 was in that gray bin. There was, there was self-defense rounds elsewhere within PDQ that were live. Not yeah. 45 long Colt, though. That's what I was going to ask. What caliber was your uh, self-defense rounds? Uh, 357, 38 special, and 300 blackout. Okay. Approximately how many firearms does PDQ own? Hundreds. Do you keep all of them at the Albuquerque location? No. Do you have another location? I do. Where's that? It's in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. You were asked a series of questions about um, primed cases. Do you recall those questions? Yes. What is exactly a primed case? The primed case is uh, is a, is a is a case could be a shotgun shell with just a primer, but it, it, we differentiate a prime case from a blank in that there's no additional charge of gunpowder to make a report, a noise, a bang, or a puff of smoke, and so it's a good training tool. It, it's a loud cap gun when it goes off. It helps initiate action on a set where there needs to be choreography, choreography of movement. Um, and, uh, and if you add talcum powder, it provides a bit of, of puff to it. So a primed case is just simply an empty brass, I'm gonna suggest brass, I know it doesn't have to be brass, uh, shell casing with a live primer, is that right? That's correct. But it has no gunpowder. No gunpowder. And it has no projectile. Definitely not. That would be a live round. Can a primed case kill someone? It can lead. Yes, it can. In a, in a number of different ways. How would that happen? Well, in the, in the Brandon Lee situation, a, a prime case uh, initiation of the primer was enough to deliver the bullet, the projectile, into the barrel, causing what's called a squib load. And in that instance, uh, what happened is, is the prop crew was unaware of what had happened. Uh, they emptied what were supposed to be dummy rounds, and they were not, um, because the live primer does, thus makes them something other than. And it's but let me ask you this. In order for a primed case to hurt someone in the manner that you're describing, such as the incident with Brandon Lee, there has to be a projectile somewhere, right? Yes. And in that case, there was a projectile lodged in the barrel of the gun. Correct. Okay. Um, but the primed case itself, just the empty casing and the live primer, that's not going to kill anybody. Highly doubtful that right. it would. Cause uh, injury, yes. Okay. Um, you, you said that it sounds like a, like a loud pop gun. It sounds like, yeah, it sounds like a loud, loud cap gun. Cap gun, I'm sorry. Um, because... The primer has a small amount of explosive substance, and it's that that lights the gunpowder that emits the projectile, correct? That's correct. Were all of your 45 long Colt caliber live rounds that you had at, PD, at PDQ, were they all taken by the Sheriff's Department? Yes. You were asked some questions about Starline brass casings. Is, a, is Starline brass uh, a very common casing? It's one of the primary uh, sources of cases for, for Joe Swanson. Um, but I've come to learn that even the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department uses it as one of their duty ammos. <laughs> right. um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the package that you received from Ms. Gutierrez after she finished her work on the old way. Um, you indicated that there were some leather belts, uh, but you didn't inventory those. That, correct. Uh, did you notice, were there 
appearing to be dummy rounds in those leather belts? Yes. Did you inventory those? I did not. Were those your property? No. When you received the package from Ms. Gutierrez, did it also include firearms? Not in the box with the uh, with the gun leather. There were at least there was at least one replica firearm within that box. Um, in separate cases, I, I believe there are probably two Pelican type hardened cases that contain firearms as well as other replicas and the um, but it, but her the box just containing the leather did not have fire uh, firearms in it but you did receive a box from Ms. Gutierrez that she shipped to you from Montana that contained firearms is that right correct yes and those were shipped to you because they were your firearms right some of them were yes some of them were also fails. Okay. Um, when you received the box that contained the firearms, um, was there anything concerning about the state they were in? Yes. Uh, the primary concern is that they were, some of them were loaded. Uh, Mr. King, you said that some of the guns were loaded? Yes. What were they loaded with? What I found out that they, they were loaded with dummy rounds in the end. And why was that concerning to you that the guns had been shipped to you loaded with dummy rounds? So whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Okay. Well, because the assumption is that is that one guns are always loaded unless you verify that they they are not and two that rounds are live unless you validate that they are dummy rounds and the fact that the that a couple I believe it was from memory a couple of the revolvers were loaded with rounds leads me to default that they I have to assume these are live rounds until I validate that each and every one of the rounds are dummy rounds and that the guns are completely empty. So there was, there was some sweaty palms uh, that moment. Okay, um, I'm gonna shift gears here. I'm gonna show you what is um, already in evidence as States Exhibit 168. I want you to have a look at this photo and tell me if the projectile shapes that you described um, to Mr. Bowles are present in this photo. It looks my 99% uh, are semi-wad cutter bullets. There's an oddball 
right in the middle of the photo. Uh, and where can you use your screen? Oh, that's the oddball. Okay, sure. Yeah, that's that has a that has a projectile that I don't remember seeing. Uh, it's neither a semi wad. Uh, they probably they probably would consider that some variation of a wad cutter, but it almost looks like a trunc truncated cone type uh, projectile. Okay, and you had and truncated cones were were one of the uh, projectiles that you recall from 1883, correct? Yeah, the tr the cowboy training camp. All right. I'm going to show you what's been uh, what's already in evidence. The state's exhibit 171. How would you describe those? Uh, that's another variation of a uh, semi wad cutter. Okay. Would you consider that a truncated cone? No. All right. I'm going to show you what is already in evidence as State's Exhibit 57. Um, would these be a primed case? Well, I can't see what's on the opposite end away from the nickel primer. Um, you know, is there a projectile for, on the for, end? For the purposes of, uh, of this question, let's assume uh, that there is no gunpowder in those casings and there is no projectile at the other end. Yeah, I would, I would call these a, a spent case um, because the primers have been hit. But at the same time, we have to assume that any primer is potentially live, even though, even though it's been struck, because it could be a hard primer. Uh, but easily, commonly, if somebody, you know, the layman took a look at this picture and said, well, what is that? I would say a spent case, casually. But I would not make a dummy round out of that. Sure. Um, in order for, for a primed case to be a primed case, it has to have um, a, an unstruck primer, correct? Yes, and we assume that it's not an inert prime case. Uh, if, if, if we're saying, what are we going to, we need to initiate some kind of action with the least amount of noise, uh, I would call up Joe Swanson and say, I need a box of 50 prime cases. Okay, um, but those don't appear to be that to you, do they? They don't. I don't know what that is, to be honest with you. It, it could be in, 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 the, in the providing weapons and blanks and dummy rounds to production for, for film. I don't know what that is. I All mean, right. you know, casually, I would say if I was just a shooter out there, I would say, no, oh, it's, it's a spent case. Right. It looks like a spent casing. Yeah. Um, All of the dummies that you provided to the set of rust, the 45 long colt dummies that came directly from you, um, did all of them rattle? Yes. Did you provide any um, dummy rounds to the set of rust that did not rattle? I did. Which ones were those? Those were the 44 Henry uh, copper plated rounds. And those are completely different looking than anything, that, than any of the 45 long colt dummies, correct? Correct. They haven't made 44 Henry since the pre-1900. So the 44 Henrys, how do you know that those are dummies? Well, they don't make them anymore. And how do you know they're dummies if they don't rattle? It's a problem. You assume that they're, you assume that they're live then. Is there a hole in the side? How do you know it's a dummy? You don't. That's a problem. There's no hole in the side. There's no hole in the side. Do you know whether or not, did you say they were 4470s? 40, uh, 44 Henry. 44 Henry. Do you know whether any of the 44 Henrys uh, were ever even used on the set of rust? No. You don't know? No. And, and to be clear, the 44 Henrys don't have a, a traditional primer. They're, you cannot reload them. They're like a, they're like a 22 rimfire. It's the same thing. It's just an oversized version of that. All right. You were asked uh, some questions about um, how many times 
You called Detective Hancock. Why did you call her so many times? Just to aid in the investigation, whatever she needed, or if I found something that I thought she might want to see, or if I had any questions. It was routine for us to, uh, to be in communication. Okay. Um, you, you were... You made a statement on cross-examination uh, that you didn't want to work, I think it was in a text message maybe, that you didn't want to work with uh, Ms. Gutierrez in the future. Is that correct? Do you recall yeah. making that statement? Yeah. I'd okay. Say, yes. um, why didn't you want to work with her in the future? Well, the issue of uh, loading a full load blank with a, with a horse in the in the vicinity is a huge violation of an armorer's work. So why don't you explain to the jury what you're talking about because I don't think that we've addressed that issue yet. Was there was there an issue that came to your attention with regard to um, uh, the set animals and a full load blank? There was uh, Several days prior, and I don't, I can't, I don't know exactly when it happened. Sarah Zachary uh, called to discuss a number of things, including her concern. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop you right there. Oh, I got it. Yep. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> did you receive information that there was an issue with a with a full load blank and a and an animal? Yes. Okay. Stop there. Um, Generally speaking, explain to the jury what types of blanks are to be used around animals, what types are not, and why, having nothing to do with what happened on rust. Uh, in general, we've, we have several, several iterations of blank loads, and the idea is that we always want to use the least amount of noise and gunpowder for the effect necessary. Uh, and so if ultimately we could get away with using nothing but a prime case, that would be ideal. Um, you know, Sir, in terms of blanks, what are the appropriate size blanks to use around horses on a movie set? A horses and kids, no greater than one quarter load. Um, so it, is there a blank load that is less than a one quarter load? There is one eighth as well, yes. Okay. It, why is it not advisable to use full load blanks around set animals? Well, it's, it's frankly, it's considered animal cruelty. Okay, Mr. Kinney, we're going to move on. Uh, you were asked some questions about making dummy rounds into live rounds. Do you recall those questions from Mr. Bowles? I do. So it sounds like that would be um, a bit of a complicated process. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, let's talk about the opposite. 
Would it be considerably easier to turn a live round into a dummy? It would be not. It, it, it would be. It, it's not the ideal situation again, especially if we're talking about. I'm not asking what's ideal. I'm asking, would it be easier? Is one less step? Well, no. Actually, we're excluding. You'd have to press out the primer. It's 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 less complicated. So, if one were to try to turn live rounds into dummy rounds, would they need any special equipment? They would need full reloading. I'm just asking you if they would need special yes. equipment. Yes, yes. Is one of the pieces of equipment that they might need an inertia puller? A bullet puller, yes. A kinetic puller would be one of them, yes. All right, thank you. You were asked some questions about your training of Ms. Zachary. Um, did you train Ms. Zachary specifically on how to handle a single action army revolver? No. You were asked a series, you were shown a series of photos uh, and asked about Joe Swanson labels. Do you remember that? Yes. Mr. Balls, you want to come up here real quick? All right, um, I, I'm going to show Mr. Kinney uh, state's exhibits 193 through 208, and I don't believe there's an objection, and I would ask for permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. Page 193. To what? 208. 208. Is it admitted? You may publish. Now, Mr. Kinney, for the purposes of these questions, I, I, I want you to think back to the photo that you saw of the uh, Joe Swanson box that was taken from the set of Rust. Do you recall the photo I'm talking about? If not, I'll show it to you again. The one on the prop cart, just to be clear. Yes. Yes? The dummies. Yes. Joe Swanson dummies. Yes. With the JS in the middle. Yes. And you indicated that you have never had a box that had that kind of label. Correct. So Specifically 45 long coal. Well, let's go through them. Uh, States Exhibit 193, are those labels uh, just like the one from the set of rust? Well, no. Right. That's not a trick question. <laughs> um, how about these? States Exhibit 194, are those just like the ones from the set of rust? No. Same question here, 195. We've got several boxes. If you need me to zoom in on anything, I'm happy to. No, it's, yes. No, I don't I need you to zoom. Are any of those the same as the box from Rust? No. These, are any of these the same as the box from Rust? No. How about these? No. And that's, for the record, States Exhibit 197. States Exhibit 198, how about these? No. States Exhibit 199, how about these? No. States Exhibit 200, same question. No. States Exhibit 201, same question. No. States Exhibit 202, over on the left, same question. No. States Exhibit 203, same question. No. States Exhibit 204. No. States Exhibit 205? No. States Exhibit 206? No. 
States Exhibit 207? No. States Exhibit 208? No. Um, you testified that you provided some fake guns to uh, for rust. Is that right? Yes, replica guns, yes. Um, did you provide any fake long guns for the set of rust? No. I don't have anything else. Thank you. I have two follow-up. All right. Mr. Kenny, just uh, to follow up, um, with regard to turning a live into a dummy, you talked about one piece of equipment. What other uh, equipment would you need to do that? Well, you'd need a piece of equipment to uh, press out the primer. Um, you'd need, you know, a press and reload it and it installed with a proper reloading dies. Uh, you would need some way of, of measuring powder as well, potentially dispensing the powder. And then you need a piece of equipment to load the primer into the case. Okay. Now, I think you testified that you didn't train Sarah Zachary on the use of the single action revolver? Correct. And she was under your license, um, so was she not permitted to use that? No, it, it, she was permitted. Okay. Even without the training? Well, a cold gun, it, it's a good question. I, I don't recall going over, I just don't remember training her to check for safe on a single action army. I think, you know, the, the thinking was, is Hannah's the armor. She's going to take care of it. Okay. But you did uh, train her with regard to, I mean, you did certify her on your paperwork. Well, there's no certification. Okay. Not certification, but you did have her on your paperwork. Correct. Okay. All right. You're excused. Thank, Thank you, Your you. Honor. Next witness. The state will briefly recall uh, Corporal Hancock. Sure, you're doing okay. Do you need a bathroom for a kid? Okay, sure. Okay. I can't hear you. Mr. Judge, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. for uh, your, your second uh, round on the witness stand. Um, as, a, as a sworn law enforcement officer, are you familiar with the uh, crime of negligent use of a firearm? Yes. And what are the different ways that uh, the elements of negligent use of a firearm can be fulfilled?
atrás.
All right, you may be seated. All right, Corporal, um, we're going to move on. Were you present in the courtroom uh, when Mr. Haig was doing his demonstration with his single action army? Yes, I was. And as a trained law enforcement officer, are you proficient in firearms? Fairly proficient. Um, have you been able to access that gun that Mr. Haig was using for his demonstration today? Yes. And did you attempt to view the barrel of the gun without removing the cylinder? Yes. Were you successful? Yes. You were? Well, sorry, in looking at it, yes, but not fully. Okay. Uh, so why don't you explain to the jury uh, what you did um, in order to try to do a barrel check for uh, debris or items in the barrel without removing the cylinder. Okay. Um, so with the uh, revolver that Mr. Hick had brought in, um, what I did was essentially I took the hammer to half cock which would allow that cylinder to spin freely. Um, so then I tried to look down the barrel, kind of from the side of that revolver. Um, you can see a little bit of light shining through it, but you cannot fully see like an unobstructed barrel view when you're looking down it. So it's essentially what I would kind of consider looking like at, at, like at a corner. Um, so you're not really able to see, you know, parts of that corner. Um, next, I pulled the hammer fully back all the way um, to see if you could see where the firing pin goes um, into that cylinder. So I tried to um, look down that way to see if I could see the entirety of the barrel. Again, that hole is it's too small. Um, I could see light shining through but not enough to where I could say that the barrel was um, you know, completely empty or that I would be confident enough to say that there wasn't anything in the barrel. And then the last thing that I did uh, uncomfortably is I actually took that uh, revolver and uh, with it at the full cock position, I actually looked down the barrel of that gun and used a, a light source because it was really hard to see in it with it being, it, it's dark, it's a darker barrel. So I looked, um, actually had that barrel pointing at my face and uh, to try to look down it too dark to see it just normally so I used um, a light source to try to look down but again when you're shining that light source down the barrel you're having to move in different directions so personally I wouldn't comfortably say that um, that the barrel would be free of anything like debris or um, you know any sort of particles in in those checks all right thank you um, shifting gears, uh, are you familiar with the name Brian Norvell? Yes. And do you know whether or not he was interviewed in this case? Yes. You know or he was? He, he was. Okay. Um, and were the defense attorneys present for that interview? Yes, they were. Have you listened to the entire interview? Yes, I have. Did the defense, uh, uh, and let me ask you, in terms of the, let's go back to State's Exhibit 2, in terms of uh, Mr. Benavides's video, who is Brian Norvell on that video? So in that lapel video, Brian Norvell is the individual that brings that prop cart over in front of the patrol unit to Lieutenant Benavides, and he's the same individual that it reaches his hand over the crime scene tape to um, pick something up off the cart. Approximately how long was the interview that you listened to? Uh, it was about an hour and 45 minutes, give or take. Did anyone from the defense ask Mr. Norvell any questions? No. Um, 
were you present in the courtroom when Mr. Bowles asked um, Mr. Kenny approximately how many times he called you? And I think Mr. Kenny agreed it was approximately 40 times. Yes. Um, how many times did Mr. Bowles call you? Quite a bit. Um, not just calls, but also emails and text messages. Would you say it was more than 40 times? I, I'd say at least around there. And how many times have I called you? Uh, a handful, maybe between five and ten. All right, thank you. Yeah. I'll pass the witness. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Corporal Hancock, isn't it true that I'm representing um, Ms. Gutierrez Reed in this case, and I called you and emailed you in that capacity? Yes. And Seth Kinney, on the other hand, is a potential suspect in the case, right? According to who? Well, you're the investigator. Did you ever look at him as a potential suspect? Yeah, he was investigated. Okay, so that's what I'm asking you. Do you normally talk to potential suspects that many times in a case? I don't think there's a limit to how much we talk to them. Um, with regard to the barrel obstruction you looked at, and you did that, thing, you're not an expert in inspecting firearms. No. And you said you're fairly proficient, but you don't know, for example, the tools that are used. Um, you didn't have a tool with you? No, that was just by eye. Okay. So you just did kind of a casual uh, attempt, but you're not an expert at doing that, are you? Um, I tried to replicate the way that was said that the barrel checks were done. Well, you didn't have the tool. You just said that. Correct. And did you do this outside? Uh, it was done inside. Yeah, and the, are you aware the light is quite a bit different when you do it outside? Correct. So <clears throat> you said even doing it inside under less favorable lighting conditions, you were still able to see some light coming through it, correct? Yes. And you didn't replicate it outside, did you? No, that's why I used a light source. Okay, and you knew this was being done outside on the rust set. I would assume so, but yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was done inside as well. Oh, you don't know that? Correct. So you're assuming, so your demonstration did not repeat the same conditions either that were done on the rest set, did it? Again, I can't say the exact way that it was done on rest. Okay. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. Do you need any water? Thank you, Your Honor. Water would be great. Thank you.
Good afternoon, sir. Would you state your full name for the record, please? Good afternoon. Michael Allen Primo. <laughs> Mr. Primo, how are you <clears throat> currently employed? I am employed through a company called Primo Forensics, where I am a partner. Uh, the firm specializes in the analysis of digital multimedia evidence, so audio recordings, video recordings, and image recordings used in litigation. Can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, your education and background and experience in this field? Sure. So I began my education and training with the University of Lawrence Technological University uh, in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, I obtained a bachelor's in audio engineering technology. Uh, from there, I started getting training from LEVA, which is the Law Enforcement and Emergency Services Video Association. Uh, I pursued LEVA training one through four and became a certified forensics video technician. Uh, I've also received training in the products for image and video enhancement um, through one of the popular vendors is Amped, uh, as well as uh, Input Ace, formerly known as Axon Investigate. Um, I've also received training from uh, Leica in the analysis and use of 3D laser scanning technology. Uh, Medex Forensics, which is another forensic tool used to authenticate um, multimedia evidence. And I think that covers it. Do you belong to any professional or scientific organizations? I do. Um, I'm currently uh, a member of SWIGDE, which is the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. They're a organization that generates best practices uh, in digital multimedia forensics. Uh, as well as digital forensics, so audio forensics, video forensics, image forensics, uh, computer forensics, uh, which includes cell phone forensics, um, and then they also have a quality committee uh, that handles the quality control for digital forensics. Uh, I'm currently serving as the video chair with the video committee. I'm also a member of the Audio Engineering Society, the International Association for Identification, and Leva. And sir, can you? Um, how, how long have you have you been in in this field? I've been practicing for a little over ten years now. Um, and during that time, who have some of your uh, clients been, or parties that you've assisted? So I've worked for both sides of the court. Um, on criminal as well as civil cases. Uh, so both the defense as well as the plaintiff uh, for civil cases and for criminal cases, the prosecution uh, and the defense. I've contracted for the DOD, the DOJ, the FBI, the FDA, and several uh, attorney general's offices. So a lot of attorneys. And uh, specifically, have you been uh, qualified as an expert uh, in the areas of audio or video and image forensics? Yes, I have. How many times have you been qualified as an expert in those areas? I have given testimony as an expert a little over a dozen times in various courts throughout the United States. Uh, and then I've also provided deposition testimony, uh, probably about the same, maybe a little more. Uh, Your Honor, I would ask the court to recognize Mr. Primo as an expert in the areas of audio, video, and image forensics. Any objection? No objection. All right, so you are recognized as an audio, video, image forensics expert. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Can everyone hear me okay? I feel like the, I'm not talking directly into the microphone. That's a little better. Thank you. The acoustics in the room are a little strange. Okay. It's good to know. Um, how did you become involved in this case? <laughs> uh, we were contacted initially. We were contacted initially to examine several sources of digital images that were captured from a variety of devices um, by Ms. Morrissey. And 
Did you prepare a report? Yes, I did. And was your work peer-reviewed? Yes, my work was technically peer-reviewed by a colleague of similar qualifications. And is that what peer review means? You give it to someone else in the field and they double check your work? That's correct. To ensure the accuracy of the application of the methodology, uh, as well as the opinions offered, it's recommended that reports are technically peer reviewed by a colleague that has similar qualifications. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some exhibits. We're going to get ourselves set up. Mr. Bowles, do you want to? Come up here and have a look. Don't let, let's hold off on that one for just a second. All right, um, Mr. Primo, I am showing you what is already admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 118. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And is this an image that I provided you to uh, do some enhancement on? It appears so, yes. And is there a particular part of this image that you were asked to uh, enhance or clarify? Yes, so the area uh, specific. George, will you show him how he can touch and clear? Okay, so this is a touch screen. So the arrow indicates the section of the image that was the focus of the request, which appears to be some sort of ammunition for uh, enhancement as well as enlargement of the, the image. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you what I have marked as State's Exhibit 178, um, and I would ask the court to admit it, and I would ask for permission to publish. No objection. State's 178 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Primo, can you explain to the jury what we're looking at in State's Exhibit 178? Sure. So the, the tool that was used uh, primarily throughout the course of the investigation uh, is called AMPT5, which is a audio or an image and video analysis tool, not audio analysis, uh, with which when you bring the image into the tool, it performs a non-destructive workflow that allows us to clarify or identify specific regions of the imagery, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen as the clarified uh, identification for the, the version that was enhanced. Clarification and enhancement kind of are synonymous with, with the legal admissibility. Um, the image on the left is a specific filter arrangement in the tool that allows us to compare what was originally cropped or selected and then what was uh, clarified, what processes were applied. So we can see, uh, in accordance with best practices, what exactly happened between the two uh, components, the two sections that were cropped. Um, so 
When you attempted to clarify the image, is there a reason that you weren't able to make it less blurry? So I applied a deep blur, uh, several deep blurring processes to try to clear up that blurriness that you're seeing in the image. Uh, and they were unsuccessful at being able to accurately make it so that it was perfectly in focus again. So there were likely a, a number of reasons as to why uh, that portion of the imagery became blurry. So light level adjustments were applied. Um, if memory serves sharpening, which improves the edge detail uh, against different edges. Uh, and then of course, enlargement or resizing of the, of the image. And sir, the fact that this portion of the image that I asked you to uh, take a close look at, the fact that that is in the background of the photo, how does that affect things? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, um, if I go back to Is the ammunition in the foreground of the photo or the background? It's, it's in the background, yes. Um, how does that affect whether, wh whether it's blurry or not, if it does? It, it doesn't necessarily affect it from a clarification perspective. It wasn't so far out of blur that I would consider it unreliable to make determinations from. We can still see a lot of information in that background. It wasn't like those objects were several hundred feet or even uh, further away from the, the focus of the camera. Um, but that being further back in the scene does uh, complicate our ability to deep blur it effectively. Um, and is that because they are blurry in the original image? Yes, they're out of focus on some level, yes. All right. I'm gonna go back to States Exhibit 178. Um, just by looking at the images, are you able to, do you notice um, different colors of metal in the center of what appears to be ammunition? I do, yes. What are those colors? The colors appear to be visually dissimilar in terms of color as well as light. Uh, the area depicted here as I'm, oops, with the arrow, the center part, uh, my understanding is that it's some sort of primer of that ammunition component, uh, is a uh, darker region than the area that's depicted by this arrow on the right, which is brighter. Okay, thank you, sir. And I'm showing you what is already in evidence as States Exhibit 162, where you provided this image for clarification and forensic work. Yes, I was. Uh, and was there a particular part of this image that I asked you to focus on? Yes, so the section identified by the arrow here is the section of the screen that was of interest for clarification, so enhancement, uh, as well as resizing or enlargement of that imagery. And were you able to enlarge and clarify that image? Yes, that section of the image was suitable for clarification and then uh, exhibits were generated, enlarged. Uh, in the compare and uh, original format that we saw earlier, where it's the side-by-side, -side, uh, as well as a picture-in-picture -picture style within the tool AMP5. How do you know whether or not the image is um, appropriate for clarification? There are several components that we evaluate when we receive the images. Uh, things like, are the objects uh, high enough resolution or pixels. So every picture is made up of lots of little squares that are pixels. And if the resolution of that picture is limited, then the enlargement process could produce uh, inaccurate results for clarifying or making that image bigger. Um, in addition, the, the position of those objects within the scene, the light level of that scene, so is the image too dark 
that we can't actually restore or enhance those sections to make them uh, more visible to the human eye, um, as well as things like uh, compression, uh, image compression or data compression, uh, which can reduce the amount of information that was originally captured by the device or introduce information that wasn't originally there. So we evaluate all of these components prior to engaging with an enhancement and applying that enhancement methodology, um, which was ultimately reported back to Ms. Morrissey prior to beginning. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to show you what I have marked as State's Exhibit, is it 176? Your Honor, for the record, Mr. Bowles does not have an objection uh, to, to uh, any of these exhibits. So um, for, I, I would ask that 176 be admitted into evidence and obviously for publishing. 176 is admitted, uh, you may publish. Mr. Primo, what, what are we looking at here? This is a clarified uh, exhibit that depicts that region of interest, which is demonstrated in the lower right-hand corner, uh, that has been enhanced using uh, sharpness, light level adjustments, as well as, uh, it's a picture-in-picture -picture style, but a zoom, if you will, of the area of interest, um, which is the ammunition and the, it appears to be some sort of container. Thank you. Um, this is State's Exhibit 177. Um, I'd like to move it into evidence and publish it. No objection, Your Honor. State's 177 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Primo, can you describe what we're looking at here? This is a demonstrative exhibit that shows the original frame picture that was processed or clarified uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, which has been, if memory serves, rotated slightly so that we can better see it within this exhibit. Light level adjustments, so shadow, shadow and highlight improvements, uh, sharpening, and then uh, enlargement of the, the pixel region. Uh, so that's the original version, and then on the right-hand side, all of those processes were applied, um, a side-by-side -side exhibit. Uh, are you able to see just by using your eyes, uh, a slight difference in the color of the primers of the ammunition on the top area of that styrofoam insert and the ammunition uh, here in, in this lower section. Yes, so these two things that we're evaluating are visually dissimilar. Oh. in terms of light and color. And while you have testified that you can see the difference, um, are there some things that, that you can do in order to verify that, the, um, that, the, that they are actually different colors? There are some tests that we can apply to analyze that information on a deeper level. Uh, which is at its core evaluating how the technology works. So in this case, it was some sort of Apple device, iOS device, and whether or not that information that was being collected by the electronics within that device was being accurately communicated to that digital format. Uh, so there's, there's a, a test that we applied throughout, I applied throughout the analysis. Uh, on this particular image, I was not confident in my ability to do so. To verify it. Correct, to, to verify that those tonal values, uh, those, those color and luma values are in fact uh, dissimilar. So just to be clear, your testimony is you can see the difference, but you are not able to digitally verify it. That's correct. Okay. Uh, let's switch over for a video, and of course, unfortunately, that requires me to change devices. Thank you for your patience. Unplug.
would like to play what has been marked as State's Exhibit uh, 187. Um, Your Honor, the foundation for these videos was laid by the gentleman from Production Outfitters, uh, and I would ask for permission to publish. Sorry, 187. No objection, Your Honor. All right, 187 is admitted. You may publish. Sir, were you asked to uh, review um, a, a couple of videos and, and and take those videos and enhance still frames within the videos? Yes, uh, I think it was, if memory serves more than a couple, but yes. <laughs> okay. Um, this is State's Exhibit uh, 187. Do you recognize this video? I do, yes. And is this one of the videos that you um, uh, digitally enhanced for me? That is correct. You know, and quite frankly, I, I understand that we can't hear it, but the whatever is being said is not relevant. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the, the audio, okay? Okay, understood. And w what specifically were you asked to do with regard to this video? Uh, what, what, was I, what was I asking you to look for and try to enhance? The pixel regions are the areas depicting the ammunition within what's my understanding is uh, a bandolier uh, that Mr. Baldwin is attempting to um, wear. Uh, several still images uh, were extracted from the video recording for clarification. And um, can you see the ammunition uh, with the primer side of the ammunition facing the camera in this still frame? That is correct. Uh, would this be an example of some of the still frames that you collected from this video at my request? I would have to examine the specific video image numbers, but it was in this range that it becomes most visible. I'm, I'm uncertain if it's this exact video image. Every video image uh, in a video recording is marked with a frame number, so we count them. We can count them in a linear fashion. Uh, I, I would have to examine the project to know if definitively if it was this video image, but it was in this series of time. It was yes. one of these still frames in this video. Correct. A yes. And perhaps more than one. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, I am going to play for you State's Exhibit 188. Same issue, Your Honor. Foundation was laid by Production Outfitters uh, and I would like to move it into evidence and ask permission to publish. No objection. State's 188 is admitted. You may publish. Uh, Mr. Primo, were you asked to do basically the same thing with this video? That is correct. When the camera was zoomed in here at the beginning, uh, were you able to collect some still frames of the ammunition in that holster? That is correct. All right. Because we have to switch devices, I'm going to show you another video from a different time frame. Okay. And then we'll move back to the uh, images. So I'm going to show you what is already in evidence as States Exhibit 164. Do you recognize this video? I do, yes. Is this another video that you were asked to uh, conduct a forensic analysis on? So this video, the way that this device works is actually recording uh, several pictures. And the, the tool that allows us to interpret those images 
plays them back in rapid succession, giving the effect that it's a video. This is a product of that proprietary tool uh, from that particular vendor of the camera. Um, but in answer to your question, yes, I, it, it is a video, but in its raw format, there are actually multiple pictures. And was and what kind of a camera is this? Do you remember what it's called? This is an Ari Alexa Mini, if memory serves. And in terms of good cameras, bad cameras, sophisticated cameras, simple cameras, where does this camera fall? Uh, the lay interpretation is, uh, it's kind of like the Lamborghini of cameras. It's a very high-end tool in comparison to other devices. All right, thank you, sir. Can you see the ammunition uh, there on the left-hand side? Yes, I, I don't know for a fact that it is ammunition, but it's my understanding that those are uh, casings of some sort. But yes, that, right. that's what it appears to be. Okay. And is it somewhere in this area where you were able to isolate some still frames? And I'll go ahead and play it for you there. That is correct. In preparation for uh, my report from my investigation, uh, four instances, four images were extracted from the tool in a raw uh, RGB TIFF format. Uh, in preparation for testimony, uh, additional images were extracted for review. And for the record, I am going to show Mr. Primo State's Exhibit 179 through 186. Um, I believe there isn't an objection. I'd like to have them admitted and permission to publish. No objection. State's 179 through 186 is admitted. You may publish. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Primo, I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 179. Uh, can you describe to us what we're looking at here. This is uh, frame 237 from one of the two of the digital video files that we saw that didn't have um, audio playback. Uh, that frame on the left hand side of the screen is what's been cropped as the area of uh, focus. And let me let me stop you real quick as a point of clarification. Uh, I showed you two videos of Mr. Baldwin putting on his bandolier, um, and then there was another video of Mr. Baldwin with, with, a, with a young man. Uh, do you remember those? Yes, the, the two with the putting on the bandolier is what okay. I was referring to. Yes. Oh, um, their monitor isn't working. Sorry. Well, that's okay. Sorry, 
Try to do it with one monitor if they have difficulty fixing it. Um, is it <coughs> is it possible to move it a little closer to? We don't need to look at it. We know what these images look like. Well, let me wait. Uh, to come up. He went to get water for the jurors. Go ahead. Okay. Um, let's uh, let me let me stop for for just a moment, uh, Mr. Primo. The first set of images that we were looking at with the styrofoam insert uh, sitting on a person's leg and the um, the ammunition in the background that was blurry uh, were you able to determine the dates that those images were taken yes the examination of the metadata which is data about data from the photos was evaluated in, in as a part of the enhancement process. And what was the date? The date that the metadata interpretation tool is reporting as the date time the original image was captured is October 10th, 2021 at approximately 9 a.m. 42, 11 seconds. Okay. Um, and, and just to be clear, um, the the videos that we showed you of Mr. Baldwin uh, putting on his bandolier, were you able to determine the date of those? I did not evaluate the date time created information from those videos, okay. no. Um, but the jury can rely on the testimony of other witnesses uh, for, for the appropriate dates for that. Uh, and then we'll get to the next one in, in a moment. So let's go ahead and, and begin again. States Exhibit 179, what are we looking at here? This is a uh, comparison of the specific region that was cropped demonstrating the bandolier and the ammunition uh, at frame 237. I don't recall which exhibit, which video exhibit this came from. Um, but as you can see here on the left, this is the original information that does not have any clarification, uh, application of any clarification uh, to it. The image on the right is a clarified version that uses um, resizing of that section to make it larger, light level adjustments, shadow and highlights, um, shadows, midtones and highlights, and uh, sharpening. 
answer in the in both images, but in particular in the clarified image on the right, are you able to determine uh, that one of the supposed pieces of ammunition uh, seems to have a silver coloring in the center? Visually, yes. Uh, objectively, through that deeper methodology that I, I talked about, uh, no, we did not apply that um, method for verification. Okay, let's move to uh, States Exhibit 180. Tell us what we're looking at here. This is uh, another instance, video image 218, 218 uh, from the video exhibit that was uh, isolated. The section on the left-hand side that was cropped is from the original video image. The section on the right was clarified and enlarged. Uh, similar processes were applied. And in this image, when we compare it to the, Im to the previous image, uh, that being States Exhibit 179, um, do you see that change in color, that silver type color, in the same place in both images, and when I mean in the same place, on the same piece of ammunition, or where, rather where the ammunition is located. That is correct. Yes, it's a, it's a lighter tonal value or representation, which is dissimilar than the other tonal values in chroma and luma, light and color, that appears dissimilar. I'm gonna show you States Exhibit 181. Tell us what we're looking at here. This is frame 237. Uh, similar processes were applied. The image on the left hand side is the original that has not been resized from the video recording. The image on the right is the clarified version that has been resized. Um, enhancement processes applied. Uh, and then the entire image was actually resized. I don't think I mentioned this to format the screen that you're looking at in an HD resolution. So had we not performed that, it would have been a little bit smaller on the screen because this section was the smallest that we enhanced. I enhanced, uh, smallest that I enhanced um, because the resolution, the picture size from these videos was much smaller than the RE, which is a very high resolution, um, and even the photos from the iOS devices, the iPhones uh, that were captured. Okay, uh, States Exhibit 182, tell us what this is. This is another representation of frame 218, so when the images were enlarged, two different resizing methods were used to uh, verify that the information that was being enlarged was accurately being done so and wasn't an inaccurate representation when it was made larger. Uh, this appears to be the other enhancement version. As you can see, it's kind of like uh, more blocky, pixel, pixely, in, if that's a forensic term, uh, on the right-hand side uh, when it was enlarged. And in all of the images that we've looked at um, in, this, in this group of images, 179 through 182, uh, do you see the lighter colored uh, primer in the same position, that being uh, what appears to be the third piece of ammunition from the top. That is correct. States Exhibit 183, what's this? This is frame 175. Uh, if memory serves, this is from the other video recording uh, because there's a clear indication of the front of the ammunition. I'm considering the front to be where the projectile is located. Um, in which case, this exhibit uh, on the left is the original uh, section of the video image that was selected, cropped, enlarged. Uh, and the clarified version that uh, uh, has clarified processes applied. Um, one particular process that wasn't included on the others is a process called deep blurring. So kind of refocusing that, uh, that image that we're seeing so it's clearer. Uh, can you see what appears to be that same silver coloring in the uh, piece of ammunition that's third from the top? It's more difficult to see in this version, but there are slight... Uh, the pixel information is there. Yes. Okay. States Exhibit 184, same question. Yes. 
the same the, to everything. The the, the, the dissimilar yes. Yeah, so the the section on the left is the isolated version, clarified version uh, on the right that has been resized, uh, and there is a dissimilar tonal value uh, visibly uh, between those. Uh, specifically, we, we examined the two ammunition that were side by side. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 185, same thing, just different frame? That is correct. States Exhibit 186, same thing, different frame? This is another version of uh, an alternate uh, resizing algorithm that was used to make the image bigger for verification that no additional information was added to the recording that rendered uh, determinations inaccurate. Like nothing was added to the video that misrepresents what was originally there. Okay, thank you, sir. Let's move to um, the images that you were able to analyze from the RE video. I'm not going to play the video on this device because it will cause the system to crash. Uh, so I'm going to move to um, States Exhibit 189. I would like to have 189 uh, entered into evidence and permission to publish. Is 189 this video? No, 189 is the digital image that oh. he created okay, from okay. the video. Okay, no objection. Case 189 is admitted, you may publish. All right, Mr. Primo, uh, what are we looking at here? And if you recall, the, it, was there a date associated with the video from the RE? May I have a moment to look at my report? Certainly. Thank you. The creation date associated with the metadata from the RE RAW proprietary tool. Uh, it's a, a program that allows us to examine the images captured directly from the RE camera in their RAW format. It is reporting a date of October the 18th, 2021. This creation time is reporting 536 and 49 seconds. Does that tell you that that's the exact date that the image was recorded on the camera? In accordance with the data that the camera was uh, communicating to the file, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and what are you able to see in terms of this same pattern that we're looking for um, uh, with regard to silver colored centers of what appears to be ammunition? I don't understand the question. Um, are, well, let me back up. Are we, what are we looking at here? Are, do we have an original and a clarified? Yes, so the image on the left is a selection of that region of the, um, my understanding is it's a bandolier or storage of some sort of those, those ammunition. Uh, and then the image on the right is the clarified or enhanced version of that image on the left. And are you able to see, just from looking at the photo, uh, that the top two items appear to have silver centers where the last four appear to have a different color center? They appear to be lighter in tonal values. I don't know if I can classify them as silver, but... Okay, understood. It, I'm it, sorry. It appears to be, if I was asked what material that looks like, it looks like silver. But whether or not it actually is, I haven't been able to verify that. But um, yes, visually dissimilar. And let me ask you, in terms of the, the date from the RE camera, does that... Does a does a date and time have to be set on the camera properly in order for you to receive that the, the proper information through the metadata for the date of the recording? 
That is how most camera devices work. I don't recall specifically if the RE was set, this particular RE by the operator, but that's uh, common for digital cameras like the RE. And were you, sir, able to um, do a tonal value analysis on this? Yes, I was. And, uh, and again, the tonal, the tonal value analysis is just a way of, uh, of doing an additional verification. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and, and what were the results of your tonal value analysis? So with respect to the RE images, there were no artifacts due to compression. These images were captured in a raw format, which means when the light information hit the camera's um, components, which is called a sensor, it's going to capture that information in raw and communicate that to a digital file with which it's not going to make determinations about what do we take away or what do we add to make this file smaller. An interpretation of that process was done using a uh, filter within the AMP tool, AMP5 tool, uh, called Channel Selector. And that evaluates the specific RGB color spaces that those tonal values uh, live, essentially, in that, in that raw format. And through an evaluation of the green channel, which is the most sensitive to the human eye, there is a, a distinct dissimilarity in the luma and chrominance values between those two sections. And when these images were clarified, uh, enhanced, two of the four images that I examined, through adding of light to make the images brighter, this section, the, the middle section of that piece of ammunition, i.e. The, the primer, uh, became overexposed, which means it had brighter values than other primers throughout that picture, and the tool reported that those values were going beyond the technology's ability to capture it. So what does that mean? It means that that section was documented by that device brighter than the other primers throughout the picture. Would you say that, that the use of the tonal value analysis did in fact verify that? It, it verified that, that it is brighter than the others? That is correct. Sorry about that. And States Exhibit 190, um, you would ask the court to move this into evidence and publish. No objection, Judge. States 190 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Primo, what are we looking at here? This is a uh, exhibit that demonstrates the selected area, approximate selected area, as the other images we saw. Uh, but it's not in the compare original format. It's just a picture in picture that is clarified <coughs> in hands. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, were you also asked to perform um, a forensic analysis on still frames from a body worn camera worn by a police officer? That is correct. And for the record, just so that the jury is aware, uh, the body-worn camera that Mr. Primo analyzed was State's Exhibit 2. I'm not going to play it because you already have it and we've already watched it. Um, I will, however, pull up State's Exhibit 192 um, and ask the court to admit 192 and permission to publish. No objection, Your Honor. 192 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Primer, what, what are we looking at here? 
This is a video image that was selected from the BWC recording. Uh, I don't recall from the file title which particular frame this was, uh, but it's a picture-in-picture uh, -picture process. Uh, using annotate, we can select that portion of the screen and enlarge it, uh, resize it, uh, add additional enhancement processes, including adjustments to the lighting, uh, sharpening as well. Um, so it's a, an enhanced version of that frame with a picture-in-picture -picture effect. And the label of that box still appears to be pretty blurry and not legible. Uh, were, were you not able to, to clarify it any more than that? That is correct. Okay. The, the compression artifacts as a result of the spatial resolution, the, the, the video quality was insufficient to uh, enhance to make that kind of identification. And when you say the video quality was insufficient, um, is there a considerable difference um, between the quality of a police officer's body-worn camera, this type of camera in particular, and a camera such as the RE uh, camera that was being used on the set of Rust? Yes, a body-worn camera, although effective, uh, its, its design is to surveil. It's a surveillance camera that's worn by an officer, so they, they record for long periods of time. Um, significant differences in uh, intended use between a cinematography camera and a body-worn camera. And finally, let's have a look at States Exhibit 191. It looks like these aren't uh, too different, but go ahead and tell us what you did. This is the uh, original information that was selected with the enhancement tool on the left hand side and then a compare original filter was applied to demonstrate the clarified version with uh, processes to enhance it. And why does it appear that there is actually less detail <coughs> in terms of the label on the box in the clarified image as opposed to the original image. Let me ask you this, when you clarify an image, do you brighten it? Yes, it, uh, it's one of the processes uh, to brighten it. If memory serves, when, we were, when I was trying to enhance for the request was to examine any identifiers on the box, not specifically that little um, two lines of uh, some sort of information, but to see if there were any identifiers anywhere on that container. So the, the light was improved to be able to examine that. Can brightening an image actually reduce some of the detail in the image? It can, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, Mr. Primo, how much were you paid for your work in this case and your report? And the firm Primo Forensics was compensated uh, a value somewhere in the 10000 range. And uh, in the process um, that you were hired to do, you take images like a picture or you, you extract one from media and then you use tools to try to clarify them. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier in your testimony there's certain things that can cause distortion. Uh, I think you said uh, if something's low resolution. Is that is that right? I don't remember saying specifically distortion. Okay. Yeah, just tell me, what are the some of the things that can cause you not to be able to get that clarification? I don't understand the question. Um, in some of the images, it looked like at the end, the ones we couldn't see anything. It didn't clarify it, so we couldn't see what was on the box. What, uh, I mean, what's, what prevents that? The resolution originally, or, or why can't you get that? 
the the resolution does play a factor in that as well as the uh, the, the compression level so at what point the camera is limiting information uh, to that digital video file those are those are two components yes okay you also said in some of the pictures you could not um, verify tonal differences and if I say it wrong just tell me but you did a verification process and you couldn't confirm that that is correct I, I was not confident uh, to apply that particular methodology because there were so many unknown variables okay so given that there's so many unknown variables, some of them you can say that there were tonal differences, like color differences, some of them you can't. Is that fair? I don't understand the question. Um, some of these pictures, you can't uh, be confident that there are tonal differences. Some of them that you looked at, is that what you said? I would have to evaluate the particular image okay. to answer that question. Maybe we okay. can show one of them. Sure. Yeah, there were some of them you said I couldn't verify. And we can go back to the number of that. But I'm just trying to get that basically what you did was you clarified and enhanced pictures. And some of them you can tell us the colors are different. Some of them you can't. Is that right? That is fair to say that the dissimilarities could not be verified in terms of how that technology was actually working when it captured those values. Yes. And your technology has got to be much more sophisticated, but it's like, you're familiar with iPhones, people can use filters, they can use edits, that kind of thing? I'm familiar, yes. Okay, but yours, I mean, basically, you must be using a much more sophisticated tool, correct? It's a peer-reviewable tool that allows us to apply methodology that is widely accepted. So it's repeatable, it's verifiable. Um, it can be evaluated by people of similar qualifications to ensure that it was being applied correctly and effectively to accurately improve uh, the information that's contained within them. I, I would say it's relative with respect to sophistication as to what we're comparing it to. Um, to an iPhone? To a filter. Oh, to a I filter. I think iPhone filter is what you had said. Yes, iPhone filter. Um, yeah. But yeah. To a one-to-one -one comparison, we'd probably have to evaluate which particular filter, but okay. uh, there's no magic in the tool if that's what I think we're trying to evaluate. Okay, yeah, that's what I was trying to ask. So it's similar to a filter. They are filters. That's okay. correct, yes. Okay. The, the filters that are being applied. Okay, thank you. I have nothing for you. Redirect. Yeah, just very briefly. Sir, in the images from the videos of Mr. Baldwin putting on the bandolier, those two videos that you extracted images from, um, the fact that you see the same color difference in the primer of the piece of ammunition that is in the third position from the top, the fact that you are able to see that color difference repeatedly in different frames, um, is that some indication of reliability that that center primer is actually a different color than the others. Does that make sense? I, I think so, yes. So with, with respect to forensic image video analysis, we're evaluating things from an objective perspective. There are components to that methodology that evaluate context, and they are best practices. I was not asked to evaluate those things with this case. If I understand your question, I think I do. From a, con a contextual perspective, yes, it does, because there are multiple instances across multiple frames with each of the devices that capture digital video files, which means more images than just one, like an iPhone. Um, so yes, contextually, it does demonstrate that, yes. Some additional level of reliability. That's correct. Okay, all right, thank you. I don't have anything else. You're excused, thank you. Thank you, Ron. This date rests. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are going to take our uh, break for the day. I have um, uh, some uh, court uh, I need to do at four o'clock. So um, the, the uh, state is rested, so the uh, 
defense will go forward. Council, please approach for a minute. All right, so uh, tomorrow morning we're going to have a couple of housekeeping matters. So uh, you all um, should be downstairs at 10, not 8.30, 10, okay? So um, I see that's um, good news for a fair amount of you. All right, so um, please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Uh, don't do any research about the rust productions or the the movie set, et cetera, et cetera, and the trial. Um, so downstairs at 10, okay? All right, uh, did I say the part, oh, don't talk among yourselves? Okay, very good, thank you. All rise.